I'd like to uh, call to order this meeting of the Niles Main District Library. Um, I believe, Cindy, you are uh, acting as our secretary this evening. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Would you conduct a roll call? Um, yes. Erin Diamond. Here. Carolyn Derblick. Here. Becky Keene Adams. Here. Diane Olson. Here. Omir Quidar. Here. Sorry. Patty Rosansky. I should not hear. Okay. Uh, Linda Ryan. Here. Okay. All right. Let's rise to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The flag looked great. Okay, well. Good job. <laughs> That's the best we're going to do for right now. Anyway, thank you. So we couldn't see uh, you, but we saw the flag. Okay, that's fine. All right, so um, let's move right along and uh, turn to our minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of the virtual uh, board meeting, actually, of January 20th, 2021? Do I have such a motion? Motion. Okay. Second. All right. Are there any uh, corrections or comments regarding those minutes for January 20th? Carolyn. Um, I would like to, um, let's see. I would like to move to include a, a missing statement. Um, it's on page four under new business. Um, I believe it has to do with, um, oh, uh, let's see, hmm, it has to do with the, wait, are we doing January 20th? Uh, yeah, there's okay. no page four. Oh, yeah. Oh, there is a page four. Is your packet missing it? Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. All right, it is page four, yes, and it's the second paragraph. I just wanted to add, um, Trustee Derblick requested the library. Yeah. I see. No, I see. Okay, I'll repeat it. Trustee Derblick requested the library dissolve the 25-year parking lease agreement with Culver School since it was rarely used in the past six years. So what you just, you want that sentence added? Is that what you're saying? Please. Yes. All right, do they move it in the seconder, uh, accept yeah. that? For the past six years? Right. Oh, you mean six months. You mean six months, don't you? No, for the past six years, we haven't been using it on our regular basis. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Oh, no, no, not at all. Rarely. No, that well, is not true. This is not true. Other people. The only time it's used is for major events. I like think uh, the staff would be requested to park there quite a bit, aren't they? Yeah. No, staff, staff uh, was, yeah, well, I usually had, there were periods where I had to remind people that they had to go back to parking in, in Culver, but I was that we were having, I don't know, 20 or 25 cars over there every day, right before the pandemic. Yeah, no, well, that's not what I've been seeing or what I've been hearing. I mean, I've been bringing this up every year. No. So if you want to just eliminate that sentence, my, the point is I requested- You to say that, but it's not true. But it is because I'm, I go past there, I get calls constantly, okay, well, I feel I, like I'm I, the police. If you're putting, if you want to put it down there because you think it's true, well, I can't say yes because it's false, it's fake news. So no, 
I don't, I, I will not put that in there. If you think. Okay. What, what is fake news no. that I requested to re, to dissolve? The okay. You can request that, but then that gives a bad perception to what the reality is. No, there's is. no such thing as a bad perception. That's it's, it's, it's not a true right. perception. Is whether so to no. add it to the. It's not a true perception. The question no. is to add it. The question is to so, add my statement. So um, I don't recall you saying that last month. And I think if you had said that, can you just right, click on the please, 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 let, please, please let me finish. And if you had said that last month, I think we would have jumped in like we have right now saying that's not correct. It has been vacant for the past six months, of course, but not for six All right, years. Um, so okay. I don't. I, I would say no. Can I remind my conversation with made comments about Will that help? I mentioned for the past six years, I bring this up every year at the budget meeting. Susan has indicated that staff, she can't force staff to park there. They're even bringing doctor's notes to her. And she agreed. This is true. These are all facts. They're all on the videos. So I'm just saying because we haven't used it, we rarely use it for six years. I'm asking that we, I ask that we dissolve the 25-year parking lease. If you don't want to hear about the six years, I just want my statement in there that we came up with a six-month moratorium and I requested that we dissolve the 25-year parking lease agreement. Great. Um, I don't remember you saying that, but uh, I'll leave it up to the movement and the seconder as to whether or not they want to accept the change to their motion. or uh, And if not, we'll just vote on the motion as it was. I can't even remember who made the movement and the motion and the second. I made the second. I'm not sure who made the move. I had Diane down. All right. Diane, do you accept that change or do you want to leave your motion as it was? Diane, are you frozen? frozen. I think she's frozen. Well, I'll turn to Linda. Do you accept a change to your motion or your uh, second? I, I, I'm really having a hard time with this because I mean, if, if she said it, I don't remember saying that I remember the last six months. I don't remember the last six years because I would have been furious with that statement. Uh, based on, I'm just saying. Based on the fact I'm that we no. don't add everybody's comments, the summary of notes I would say no. So are you saying no? Is that right? Are you here, Diane? No, I don't accept the change. Just leave the All right. motion. All right. So, so what we have question? here, what we have here is we have a motion on the floor I'm to approve muted. the minutes as written. And that's what we'll be voting on. And if you uh, agree with the minutes are uh, written as correct, we'll vote yes. If you don't think they're correct as written, All right, I gotta vote get no. Uh, so, Cindy, would you please do a roll call? And people can vote based on what they recall uh, was said during the last meeting with respect to this point. Diane? No, she's still present. Um, yes. Diane said yes. Okay. Omir? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? But just for clarification, we're voting on the minutes as is. Correct. Correct. Okay, my vote is no. Okay. And then before you move I'll on, can I ask a minute. quick question? Wait, were we can done with me? the vote? Oh, sorry. Did Becky? Yes. Is that it? Did, did you get everyone? Yes. Sorry. Right. Carolyn, did you have a question? Oh, Patty's here. I'm sorry. Here? I didn't see Patty come in. Oh. oh. <clears throat> Patty, you're on mute. Uh, did you want to go? Are you abstaining? Are you there? Hi. Well, I think regardless of Patty's vote, that motion has passed, I believe. Yes. 
So I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, I see Patty's left, and hopefully she'll come back. Can I right, just Carol, ask a Carolyn, quick what did question? you want to say? What did we, you want to say, Carol? For the next month, when we go through minutes, um, it seems that people forget what I said, or they. The point is, minutes are supposed to be an accurate summary. If we have this issue, every time I bring up to add a, a part of my statement that no one remembers, we need to do something to bring it to the board because we can't dismiss facts because we forgot. And since we have technology at our fingertips, should we just have Susan click on the video and you could hear it? Think, and then uh, if you Linda refuse to include it, that's fine. But we keep saying we don't remember. All right, Linda. Can we, can we mute everyone unless they raise their hand to talk and then they have a certain amount of time, please? Because I don't want I, to see I think that will help because I am getting a lot of feedback and it's hard to hear here. All right. Okay. Stay focused, please. Thank you. Karen, you'll have to unmute yourself. I muted everybody. All right. The next part of our meeting is public comment. Do we have any requests for public comment? Um, no one has indicated that. Oh, Tisha. Okay. All right. Tisha? Um, you are now in our meeting, and if you wish to speak, uh, please take your mute button, uh, unmute yourself, okay? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so um, I'm having a little bit of a problem. You don't have to answer, obviously, but, you know, we live right down the street from the library, and I have a hard time sitting here listening to people say that the library, that lot at Culver is always full. You guys rent out yeah. 25, 20, 25 lot, 25 parking spots. And when the, the teachers are parking and 25 people from the library are parking there, the lot is completely full. I'm not talking about like during COVID, I'm talking about pre-COVID. We drive by there all the time and that lot is never 100% full during the day when school is in session and the library is open. So I, that is not true. It is never full. It is full when you have an event. So maybe you should consider only renting from Culver when you have big events to accommodate parking because purely it's a waste of money between uh, you, you know, not utilizing to its capacity you know, only a few times out of the year when you have the big events. I mean, yay for the school, they're getting money, but boo for the library because they're losing money. So I don't know, either way I'm paying for it as a, uh, a taxpayer to the school as well as the library. So please consider another contract. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, May I, there... a, I just wanna make a clarification. We actually lease 41 spaces from Culver School. So when we're using 20 to 25 spaces, there definitely are still going to be empty spaces. Mm, okay, thank you. Do we have any other requests from pub for public comment? We do not. All right, fine. Um, I think we've invited a guest to come this evening from uh, uh, Dewberry, that is Mr. Michael McTavish. Is he here yet by any chance? Yes, he he's coming in now. All right, usually we um, like to enable our guests to speak and, and leave our meeting early. Um, so I, I'm going to ask that we move that up an agenda. This would normally have been 10A, uh, discussion with Mr. Michael McTavish of Dewberry regarding the solar project with possible action. So we'll move that up right now. Hello, Mr. McTavish. How are you? Oh, not too bad. How are you? Good, good, good. So, um, Greg, I think you have some uh, introductory remarks why, regarding why we've asked Mr. McTavish to join us again this evening. Is yes. that correct? Yes, right. that's true. All right, if you would just start, start out with that and then we can um, turn to, uh, to Mike here. Terrific, thank you. Uh, last month, the Board of Trustees awarded a contract for solar engineering services to Dewberry of Elmhurst. Uh, after that contract uh, was negotiated and signed, 
the library began to supply data to Dewberry to help out in their analysis to confirm the savings that the library anticipated for the project. Uh, almost immediately, uh, Dewberry reported that the annual electricity consumption was closer to uh, 900,000 kilowatt hours annually rather than the 90,000 kilowatt hours, which is what I had included in the advertisement for consultants. We asked Dewberry to stop any further work until they could meet with the Board of Trustees tonight, uh, which is a good thing uh, because uh, had we not done this uh, initial analysis, we would have been a lot further down the road when, uh, when the error was uh, uh, when the error was found. So it's a good thing that we uh, hired a consulting firm for this. Um, we also worked with them, uh, and, and as part of this, we were working with them to establish a baseline economic model for the, you know, for the project as a first step. The error in annual electri electricity usage was either a misunderstanding of the measurement or an omission of a digit or phrase in the expression of the library's annual usage. I can't honestly say which, but I'm taking this moment uh, to express my personal regret in making this error and apologize to the board as a whole for making presentations on a possible solar array project, which were incorrect. Uh, it should be obvious at this point that the economics associated with the construction of a solar array on the library roof is, have changed significantly uh, as a result. Um, to Trustee Derblick directly, uh, in the last quarter of the board meeting in January, you brought this discrepancy to my attention. I didn't give your comments the attention that they deserved. And for that, I apologize and pledge to do a much better job going forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Mike McTavish. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, Mr. McTavish, so uh, Greg has explained to us that there was uh, a mistake in the number of kilowatts that uh, we anticipated or that we thought we were using. And uh, you had a chance to look at that. That information was, was caught uh, fairly soon. Um, you know, I understand from our director and directly that, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, your firm, uh, while you would need to bill us for the work that you have done, have, are not holding us to the full contract that we had signed anticipating that you would go forward with all the work. Is that correct? Well, that, that's correct. And that was um, a change to our standard terms and conditions to the contract. You know, we have standard terms and conditions. Um, the lawyer that you had look it over said, you know, we want mutual severability for any reason whatsoever. So if you wanted to terminate my contract right now, you are within your obligation to do so. Okay. All right. Good to know, Mr. McTavish. But uh, can you tell us, um, based on the new corrected information that you have, uh, what can you tell us about the advisability of this project, what, uh, what we can do with the numbers as we have them now, and, and how that would play out for us? Well, the initial plan was that we had enough flat roof space on the newer part of the library <clears throat> that would offset your 90,000 kilowatt hours of use annually. Um, and as Greg mentioned, our first task under this contract was to obtain all the utility bills, review your power usage and do a more in-depth um, study of exactly how much space we're talking about using on the roof to um, offset the building's power usage. And, and when we found the discrepancy, you know, the first thing I did immediately was kind of, you know, bring this to, to Greg's attention saying, hey, there's, there's something that you know we need to address right away before anything else happens. And um, as you mentioned, you know that I basically put a pause on any further evaluation based on that, because quite frankly, you don't have enough square footage on your roof to offset your your building. And even if we did some sort of grade mounted array as a carport or something, you'd still have a hard time getting there um, to fully offset your power use. And you know, economically, there's some things you can do to help uh, help offset the cost, um, but you're, you're never going to close that gap, um, especially as a public entity. A lot of these um, incentives are, are tax-based um, versus, you know, a public or a private 
entity who's you know has a tax bill would be seeing the benefits of that. Um, so really, the utility rebates are the main thing, especially in Illinois. That would be your your way to um, help offset your cost, and and it's it's not much um, in comparison to the overall installation installation cost. So I'm I'm sorry, I'm not following you there. Can you? Could you explain what you're saying? It, okay. It's not much. Uh, um, the the amount of rebate you would get from Commonwealth Edison for installing solar okay. on your roof is based on the size of the array, and um, it, it it would only cover like I think based on the initial array size that we had planned on, it would have covered seventeen thousand dollars, which is not going to close your gap by any means. Right. Uh, certainly wouldn't close our gap in terms of paying for our entire electric bill. No, um, it's, it's can you, can you tell us, uh, you know, what the, uh, how much, what, what percentage of our bill we would be able to pay with well, the it's, it's, array it's, that we'd be able to place on our roof and... It's a one-time, I'm sorry, it, it's a, it would be a one-time... Um, rebate you get. It's not something that occurs annually. It would just be once you're done and up and operational, they would give you a rebate check for the array. Um, your installation cost would be uh, around just using a basic rule of thumb. I haven't gotten into any sort of advanced estimates or anything. Um, Array of the size that we proposed would have been roughly two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and your annual offset um, based on your your utility bills, what you're paying per kilowatt hour, you would see an annual benefit of three thousand four hundred fifty, say three thousand four hundred sixty dollars annually on average. So to really pay for the, you're looking at 55 year payback. Right, and what was, that, what was that rebate? Can you remind me how much that rebate was? It, 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 the it, one time it, rebate. It's um, seven, 17,500. And that's mm -hmm. based on um, $250 per kilowatt of array, and that was based on a 70 kilowatt array. And that's the AC rating that's, I'm sorry, the DC rating of what's on the roof. Okay. So you add up all the panels together and that's how they figure it out. Um, all right, uh, if I'd like to see if any of the board members have any questions. So is there anything else you wanted to add before I just start opening it up to the floor? I do not have anything to add at this time, no. Okay, all right. Does anyone have any questions that they'd uh, like to ask uh, Mr. McDavish? Yes, Carolyn. Um, hi. Um, hi, initially um, your bid mentioned or, or we were we were calculating 90,000 kilowatts per year and I thought um, an average cost would have been four dollars per kilowatt or three hundred and sixty thousand, but now you're mentioning um, that it would cost uh, two hundred and fifteen thousand for the year. Um, I'm trying to figure out how it's how we're coming up with that number. It's based on uh, you would need a seventy thousand kilowatt array roughly to offset 90,000 kilowatt hours of annual power use. And typically what we've been seeing is roughly $3 per watt of array. So you take 70,000 times a thousand, you know. I got it. Yeah, so it's okay. three times 70,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's a, yeah, it's a 70 kilowatt array, so. I get it, okay. So that's where the numbers changed. Okay, so in order to, accomplish the 9,000, you need a 70,000 array. But just to clarify, this was to offset 90,000 kilowatts per year. Kilowatt or 90,000 kilowatts. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so since we're our consumption is ninety thousand per month, which is like eight hundred thousand, we're we're like nowhere in the ballpark, aren't we? No, according to your electric bills for twenty nineteen, because twenty twenty is a bad representation of a year for annual usage. Mm -hmm. um, your total usage actually was. Um, 771,000 kilowatt hours, but it's still a factor of eight or so. I'm sorry, okay, what was so the 2019 amount again? What was it? Twice? It was uh, 771,500 kilowatt hours, roughly. Okay. That was based yeah. on the electric bills that you provided to us. Okay, so that's our, and, and what we expect to get from this current um, solar arrangement is 70,000 70, total. Okay, uh, I think part of the confusion here is the array is sized in watts, okay? Um, and we're- Three times it by a thousand, so that's 700,000? The array is a size. Think think of us as looking at miles and miles per hour. Okay, the seventy thousand, the seventy kilowatt array would roughly cover ninety thousand kilowatt hours of electricity that you need. And we consume ninety thousand kilowatt hours of electricity monthly well more like sixty four thousand, but yeah well yeah, so, our, i guess in our latest figures they've gone down that's true so when um when i was looking at the uh, bills initially i chose one of the higher months which was in the eighty thousand uh, kilowatt hour range and i rounded up to ninety thousand to make sure sure that we were uh we were showing a uh, worst case scenario in terms of the cost so uh, now that uh, Mike is actually looking specifically at bills for, uh, for a year and, and can size it appropriately, we're ending up with numbers that are a little bit different. Oh no, I understand that. I'm just trying to now in my mind understand what our usage is and what we can expect from the solar, this new solar installation. So we're at 771,500 for 2019. What, what will solar arrays do for us? If we anticipated, if we put in the same size solar array that we anticipated to begin with, it mm -hmm. would have gotten us 90, roughly 90,000 kilowatt hours per year. Okay. All right, I, I think I got it now. Okay. Thank you so much for going no over that. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of different, <laughs> different metrics. Okay, well, anyone else have some questions uh, about this uh, new information? Becky. Hi, I just wanna clarify something you said too, um, that it would be 55 years for us to make the money back, is that? Simple right. payback. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. There's all right. Thanks. But, yeah. You know, yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Carolyn. Can I just ask one other question? I, you know, everybody's talking about this, so I sort of want to try to dispel all this. Everything I'm hearing. Um, there's a lot of comments about you can get you can have a solar installation, but immediately upon installation, you're losing the uh like the potential um um not electricity but the energy that you can produce and there's it would and for it to take 20 years they claim that you would be at such a low capacity you still wouldn't recoup your dollars could you share some light on what actually decreases immediately upon installation and gets worse as years go by the solar panel itself is kind of a chemical reaction, okay? And as the panel ages and it 
produces power, the efficiency of the panel drops just because the materials that make the solar panel start to become, I guess, less efficient. They degrade slightly. Um, depends on the type of panel you purchase. Some are more prone to degradation, some are less. Um, the best panels out there, you'll see, you know, at the end of useful life, you're, you're still above 90% of what you initially started with as far as power production. Um, there's other ones out there that get much worse. Um, the ones that were put up in the 1970s were terrible after 25 years. <laughs> so um, they're getting better with the technology, but you're right. Um, from day one to day the end, um, there's degradation as it goes on. And there's other factors that make them less um, effective as well. Um, dirt, debris, all that type of thing, but you can fix that. But there's inherent um, life cycle losses just with the panel itself. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate it. So um, unless somebody else wants to jump in, I, I have another question. I don't see any hands right now. But uh, Mike, if I could just run this by you, I just want to make sure this is correct. And if I, then I have a final question. So I understand 2019, the last representative year, we used about 771 total kilowatts or roughly 64,000 a month. What this array, this proposed array would generate is roughly 90,000 kilowatts or 7,500 a month. And we might be able to put a bigger array on, but probably not that much bigger than what we planned. Would that no, be correct? Th th that's correct because you have parts of your roof that shadow other parts of your roof. Okay. Um, and we hadn't planned on touching the original building because we don't have any drawings to evaluate the structure there. Um, I'd have to get a structural, or structural engineer up there to actually take measurements of that part of the roof and uh, mm -hmm. understand exactly what we're working with to see if even that's, that's feasible. Um, but yeah, you're, it's a long ways from, from balancing out your usage. So, I'm sorry, I think my internet went out for a minute, so I'm not sure if I heard anything, everything you said, but oh. I sort of got the look on your face, which told me you know, it, it, wasn't, uh, it, was, it wasn't looking really good. Um, uh, you know, well, assuming the best, that, case, no. the best scenario, could we maybe double or 50% more the number of panels we could put on, would, or maybe not even that much, I don't know. Well, best case scenario, you would double. Okay. at least. All right. Um, but even that would only bring us up to maybe 20% of the electricity we use every year. Does that sound about right? About right, yes. Okay. All right. So, um, I, 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 Patty, I see your hand up, but I just want to ask one more question. I'm going to turn it over to you, Patty, okay? Um, you know, we see other buildings, uh, large commercial buildings with uh, big arrays on top, and I'm just sort of wondering, how do they make it work financially? And is there some reason that because we're a public entity and the rebates we get, that it makes it a little harder for us to make it make financial sense? Yes, because there's other tax incentives that you can get to help offset the cost. There's also volume pricing where some of these large commercial clients um, they have national contracts, um, for example, Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, oh. They put one in Bolingbrook, Illinois, <clears throat> but they're putting them in facilities all across the United States. Mm -hmm. So the one retailer that they were working with, they were selling megawatts of array, um, <laughs> you know, just, just enormous mm -hmm. amounts of panels. So there's a bit of... Um, I guess, economy of scale there as well, too. So, um, and some people do it for the, um, 
I guess to, to show that they're being green. Um, there's a little bit of uh, positive press generated with that. Um, you know, they put <laughs> put monitors and right when you walk in the front front door, you know, this is, you know, how much electricity we saved or how many trees we, you know, didn't have to get cut down or cars off the road, that type of thing. So there's a little bit of PR there too um, when they put them in. Okay, all right. Uh, Patty, well, you go ahead. Um, I don't know how other people feel, but at this point, with it being as non-covering, or I'm trying to think of the proper word, not giving us as much bang for the buck as we thought originally, uh, I think, in my opinion, we ought to reconsider this. I don't okay. know how anyone else feels. All right, uh, Diane. So, um, Mr. McAvish, then I wonder what, if this was any other place and you were coming in to give an estimate and your professional opinion, what would you tell them about doing such a project? I mean, is it the best case scenario or is this like the end of the road? If you're looking this at this um, from a purely financial standpoint, the numbers are what the numbers are and they don't pay for themselves. Now, if there's other factors into why you want to do this, I guess that would be my question to you as the owner. What's the rationale for wanting to put solar on the roof? If it's to come out ahead financially in the long-term life of the array, and that's your only consideration, then this does not look like a good investment for you. If there's other environmental factors and, um, he said public relations type factors, then we can explore this and move forward. I mean, it, it's, I would say, what's your end goal by installing solar on your roof? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, are there thank any you. other? That's good answer. Are there other questions uh, for Mr. McTavish? Okay, all right. Um, thank you very much for your very forthright uh, explanation and uh, letting us know where we stand. We do appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn to the board now and ask if they, you know, uh, what their opinions are as to where they wanna go from this point. Patty, I think we've, we've heard your opinion. Uh, I don't know if you wanna to add to it, but I think we've heard it. Um, so is there anyone else who would like to express their opinion as to where they want to go with this project at this point in time? Diane? Um, yes, uh, I'm very hesitant to go ahead at this point. Yes, we want to serve both purposes, being environmental. Plus, we don't want to waste our money. And 55 years is a long time to recoup. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I would say no at this time, unless something changes. Okay. Thank uh, you. Linda, I see your hand up. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I agree. Uh, 55 years is too long. I am really in for the financial gain. Of course, I'm also in for the green gain. Um, however, uh, I thought it was gonna work and I thought it would be excellent for the library, for the community, for our pocketbook. Um, however, it just doesn't sound like it's the right thing at this time. It's very unfortunate. I'm, I actually, it, make, it hurts my heart. So, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, anyone else? Uh, Omer, Becky, Carolyn, I see your hand up. Well, 
he was very clear that unfortunately the numbers are the numbers and they don't pay for themselves. We, we will not get the, um, the energy that we're expecting from these arrays to offset our, our usage. Um, and remember, that's just one component. We would still need to install whatever minute portion of solar we can, we can handle, but then there's upkeep. So it would just mushroom in the wrong direction. And, and this is unfortunate, but um, I appreciate your honesty in explaining to us where we actually do stand because it seems so much more lucrative in terms of uh, what the arrays would generate and, until today. So I, I appreciate that. Well, Mayor, I see your hand up. Hi, um, sorry, I gotta get, go turn my phone off. So give me one second. Uh, Becky, I'm gonna let you go in the meantime. Yeah, well, he's gone. Um, I, I have to agree with everyone. I'm, I was very excited about this because we were gonna be able to save all this money. I was really excited about it. Uh, and now I'm very sad about it, but I, I agree 100%. It doesn't make any sense if we're not gonna get the money back out of it. So I agree. Okay, Omir, I see you're back now. Um, did you wanna express your opinion? Yeah, so so my, uh, my thought is uh, Carolyn had, uh, I believe in the last meeting or perhaps the meeting before, uh, recommended that we consider uh, buying into a solar array. I would recommend that given that this is not economically feasible at this time, I would recommend we consider that option. You know, we were looking at this twofold. Number one, we're trying to save money. Number two, we are trying to, uh, you know, be a library that looks uh, forward to, to the future rather than looking back to the past um, and the, you know, old way of doing things, so to say. So uh, I think it would still be a good move for us uh, to move forward and try to purchase our electricity in a green friendly type way. And if that can't happen by uh, uh, putting solar panels on the roof, then, you know, perhaps we should uh, uh, seriously consider uh, switching our electricity generation into buying into, um, say, uh, uh, you know, a section of an array. Okay, uh, Carolyn, I see your hands up again. Unfortunately, our consumption is much more than these um, solar gardens or so, solar communities um, um, are serving. We would need to have a yearly consumption of 90,000 kilowatt hours. That's why I jumped on that last month with Greg thinking, wow, now we actually are eligible, but we're not because our yearly consumption is like eight times more 90,000. So we don't qualify. Oh, so, so you're saying they have a maximum power allowance? Yes. And it's way below ours. Our, our, almost our monthly usage is their yearly number. Okay. All right. Okay, all right. So um, I, I would express my opinion now as being very similar to Becky's. Uh, I'm just, I'm really disappointed. Um, I was really looking forward to this project. And, um, you know, if I was just doing it with my own money, I might say, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead. I really like this idea. But I, I do feel as a fiduciary to the taxpayers, I, it just isn't that close. Um, I just feel like um, I just can't um, say that we should go ahead with this. So um, I think I've heard the uh, consensus of the board here. Um, Mr. McTavish, I wanna thank you very much for working with us. And I'm very disappointed that we can't uh, continue this project. Um, and um, if we ever, uh, you know, if it ever made sense to do so, we would very much like to use your services. We think you've been very honest and forthright with us this evening and explained to us what exactly the situation is here. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's where we, we have, uh, we're standing right now. Um, I think uh, our director uh, has already discussed with you that, you know, we'll pay for whatever the services or whatever, you know, uh, expenses have been occurred thus far. 
um, and under the contract, we will, will not be going through with the actual installation. All right. Okay. Um, do you have any Thank questions you. or anything? Um, uh, no, I, I just wanted to say, you know, this was a, it was a good opportunity. I appreciate the, you know, <clears throat> the opportunity to look at your electrical bills and, you know, be able to provide the advice I felt was in your best interest. That's what you hired me for. I hope that's what I provided to you. Yes. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay over the rest of our meeting, but if you have <laughs> other things you want to do. Something better to do. Uh, I have children this. to put to bed, unfortunately. Okay, please. Don't let us keep right. you any longer. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Aaron, may I just say a brief word? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to apologize to all of you. I did by email, but I just want to publicly apologize to you. I know it is just extremely disappointing, and I apologize that we did not catch the error before we got this far. So I'm really very sorry. At well, least you caught before we went any further. Yeah, at least they, they weren't installing them on the roof. So I right, exactly. wouldn't get that far. Anyway, okay. All right, fine. Thank you. Right, thank you. So uh, I think we'll now turn to reports. And Excuse me. Yes. Wait, Karen, before we move on, can I just mention something? What's that? Um, Is it connected to the solar? Or? Well, it's sort of part of the solar. Uh, you know, we have already um, agreed to a $900,000 roof replacement, which was more for the solar installation than for the actual need of roof repair. Um, I'm oh. wondering if we may want to revisit that because... The condition of the roof doesn't warrant that massive tear off. Well, I I don't know that I agree with the characterization that it was mostly because we wanted to do solar. We we did uh, say that we wanted to consider them at the same time. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to revisit um, their uh, vote regarding that, um, but let me ask if anyone has any comments about that. Uh, Becky. Uh, yes, my vote was not based solely on that, and I would still vote to get the, the roof redone. I would okay. still vote for that. Well, Mayor, I think I saw your hand go yeah, up briefly. I want to, uh, uh, you know, second what Carolyn said here. Um, I, don't, I don't recall exactly the details um, uh, about between the good, better, best options. But I do recall that one of the considerations was that the best option would allow us um, uh, to benefit economically from the solar panels and that it would be paid for itself under our assumptions at that time by getting uh, the solar panels put on. So if it's not being paid for itself, I do think it's worth uh, revisiting um, uh, the question. We don't have to go through the entire discussion again. I don't think there's a point in that, but I think that, you know, a two minute summary, um, you know, here's what good, better and best gets us. And then, you know, have the vote again, because the votes, I do feel she's right that they were tied together in a sense. Um, uh, I, I think we voted, if I recall correctly, we voted for both issues at the same time. And if that was the case, then to me that says, okay, if we're changing, we're changing our view on the solar panels, um, then we need to, we should at least, you know, even if the vote's going to come out the same way, I think it's worth for the record going back through and voting again on it. Um, I do, I did have a, a chart that I kept of what everyone's vote was for the roof and separately for the solar. And then you remember the third issue was the elevator, you may recall that too. Right. Um, and um, so I, I have that vote. Let me see what uh, if I have some other opinions here as to whether people want to re-examine that issue or not. Linda, did you have your hand up? Or? Um, actually, I would just like to hear what you have to say, Karen, just so that we can recap and then maybe have a, a little you know, discussion after that. Just, I'm curious. But I have to say about what I'm sorry. Oh, what? about what you, what the votes were. Oh, you, yeah. I, I do have the motion here. If you'd like me to read that, just so you know exactly what you did vote on. 
I have the minutes of that meeting. Would that be helpful? Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, Trustee Rosansky moved the Library Board of Trustees accept BEC Limited's recommendation for the repair of the library's roof as described in the best option, along with the removal of the elevator shaft and to have BEC investigate options for solar panels. That was the motion. So it was one motion. That was. All, all three parts were in one motion. That was one motion. Okay, all right. Um, all right, can I, uh, do I hear any other comments as to whether or not uh, individuals want to reopen the uh, examine the vote again. Becky, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, I just, I found the, the different scenarios if anyone wanted me to read what the courses of action yeah, were for those. Please do. Okay. So the good scenario was to replace the wet insulation and refurbish all seams in the membrane. The better, and that was for 100 and, mm, I have different numbers on here, so I'm not gonna give numbers. Um, the better was replace only the wet insulation add insulation to roofs which need to be brought up to code and replace the entire membrane. And the best option was to completely strip all roofing materials from the library and install new insulation and new membrane. Do you, do you have any, and the part that I think factored in was, um, uh, I recall he gave, you know, if we went with a good option, it's gonna last this many years. If we went with a better option, it's gonna last this many years. If we went with the best option, it's like, and obviously those are estimates, but um, I think that factored in. Um, and I don't remember what those numbers are because I remember he said something to the effect of to get the um, uh, fixed solar panels, you need to do the best option. And so because, and then he added that, well, if you get the fixed solar panels at that time, based on those numbers, that the solar panels would pay for the roof repair. And so I recall from that perspective, my thinking was, well, if the solar panels are going to pay for the roof repair and pay for themselves, then it's definitely, you know, it's a no brainer to get the roof repaired in the best way. However, if now that we're not considering that second option, now the question is, okay, how does this amortize over time? You know, how does, if we get good, bad, rest, if one's five years, 10 years, 30 years, then I think he mm -hmm. said something to the effect of that if we do get it repaired in the best way, that the expected lifetime is something like 30 years. But again, I, that's, I'm not right. remembering perfectly. So the right. only, on read. this paper that we were given, it just gives the timeline for the good scenario, which was a 10 year. That's the only thing that's stated on here as far as about years, but for the best one, I think I remember it was 25, but that's not on the paper, so I can't, it's not okay. Fact. All right, Patty, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, my thing is, no matter which situation we go with, we take the money out of special reserve, we have way more than enough to cover it in special reserve. Not only that, we can only use special reserve for large projects like this. So if we don't use it for this, it just sits there. Should we not use it for mm -hmm. this big project and... Since we can't use it for anything else, we can't put it back in any other pot, as they say, like general funds. Um, I, have, I have a question for uh, Susan and perhaps Greg. Uh, in terms of progress being started, any, you know, moving towards the, we, we, we informed them that we wanted to use the best approach. What if any work has been done so far moving us towards that alternative? And by then I'm, I'm questioning whether or not we've already gone down too far, that, too far down that road mm -hmm. so yeah. as to now change our mind or if we were to change our mind, if we would suffer some losses as a result of that. Well, I think part of the, it was part of the best option having to do with the elevator shaft part. Is that what I'm recalling? They have started on that piece of it. Doing uh, the I, you know, that was a that. fairly minor part of it, as I can recall. Um, I mean, that was something that we voted on. Uh, but I mean, the big expense has to do with the roof approach altogether. Yeah. As I recall. So they're, they're starting work on the elevator, but not the rest of the roof so far. Is that correct? So, so let me uh, 
uh, add, add a couple of things here. Um, first of all, uh, we have not engaged anybody to do any uh, actual work on the roof or the elevator shaft at this point. Um, BEC is in the BEC is in the midst of drafting um, their um, specifications. And once the specifications have been drafted, uh, then they'll let them out for bid. Uh, the last timeline that I heard was uh, that they plan to let them for bid in the first or second week of March. Um, once they let them for bid and a contractor is chosen and the contracts are ne uh, negotiated and signed, at that point, depending on how quickly they um, uh, how quickly they put their orders in and whether or not they're cancelable uh, will dictate you know how far in we are. Right now, we're just as far in as the BEC contract and what they have spent uh, putting the uh, specifications together. Um, having said that, um, if we choose, if the board chooses to move away from the best option and go to another option, uh, there's a good chance that they'll have, they may have to start from scratch in terms of the specifications because those are different jobs. Right. Um, the best option entails, you know, tearing it down to the rough deck and then rebuilding up from that point. Um, if, for example, they're doing a, um, uh, a seam and I forget what, uh, 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 you know, a seam resealing uh, or, you know, modification. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, the specifications will be a little bit different. Well, will be drastically different. So I'm not exactly sure what that does to our contract with S or BEC. But if you remember, the total contract was expected to be 51000 All right, so... So as I, as I look at our vote, uh, basically people's opinions from before, we had six people uh, advocating for best, one person for good. What we can do now is I hear there are at least several people who would like to re-examine the vote. And if someone wants to make a motion to reopen the vote, we could do that. That doesn't mean we will necessarily all vote differently uh, but we can re-examine it. But as Greg has explained to us, if we do decide to do something different, we might incur some additional costs because uh, we've already had specs drawn up for the best approach, which was what we had voted for. Uh, and of course, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to pay for that, of course. Um, so I, I see that Linda has had her hand up for a minute, so I'd like her to be able to express her opinion before we go any further. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention, I mean, I just took out the good, better, and best. Mm -hmm. If somebody would want me to read that before we had to go into another vote, um, because maybe that clarifies what we voted on. Would that um, sure. Is that fairly, yeah, if you want to go is over it, that, I mean, sure. I'm not sure. I, mean, I, I have a pile of material here, but unfortunately, I haven't yeah, really no, looked at it, it for uh, a while. Okay. Yeah. I found it, and um, it kind of clarifies what the square, the um, cost approximately per square foot is with the better. I'll just cut to the chase. It's fifteen dollars per square foot, and the best option was twenty two point fifty point fifty cents per square foot. But I can read it all if you know if everyone doesn't have it right in front of them, um, just to kind of give you an app an idea of what the warranty differences are and um, and we could just take out the solar panel piece of it and maybe that will help. I don't know, what do you think? Hmm. Or do hmm. you feel like we still need to go around? Um, let's, you know, let me ask each for, I, I think Becky, I, I understand, it sounds like you wanna re-vote again, is that correct? No, you don't. Okay, all right, I misunderstood that. Uh, Omer, are you asking, are you suggesting we revote again? Yes, Did I, I, I am suggesting we revote. Okay, and I think, Carolyn, you're suggesting that too, is that correct? Right, but I think we need to clarify exactly what we're revoting on so that we hear it one more time. Right, Before, right. Can I thank ask, you. 
Can I ask a question before we vote or whatever? Mm -hmm. Greg, you can I? It's to Greg. You just stated that the total contract was fifty one thousand. We're yes. not talking about a roof here. What, what contract are you are you referring to? Uh, the roof between the library and Building Envelope Consultants to uh, help us to. Well, okay. it starts with an evaluation of the roof, which they've yeah, done, okay. and they've presented us with three options. Uh, once okay. we've chosen an option, then it moves into uh, actually uh, putting um, putting pen to paper, so to speak, and writing the specifications sure. for the option that we've chosen. And then it goes on past that to uh, help us to uh, uh, put out a, a bid notice, uh, attract the right bidders and uh, right. the right contractors, I should say, and uh, and then to uh, make sure that the uh, bids that we receive are in fact in accordance with the specifications and so forth. And then it moves on to a construction phase. Once sure, they start sure. start to work, then they have uh, several visits that would be scheduled to make sure that they are actually putting things in place according to the specifications. And then finally, there'd be a wrap up and the delivery of all the warranties. Okay, so the 51,000 is the BEC contract to handle the roof replacement. It just was such a low number. I didn't know where it was coming from. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. And then I can I just make a comment about what we're trying to accomplish here? Um, I think it's great that Linda will read the descriptions, but I, I think um, now that we're nowhere near a solar installation, I think it we should be having maybe a different conversation and a little more in depth. What we have a roof, what's going on with that roof and what is our goal? I mean, cause this, all of these bids with the exception of the cheapest is regarding solar. And um, I wanna make sure we're addressing the condition of the roof and seriously what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, because again, even better was for a different type, I believe of solar panel. So um, there's quite a bit here. However you want to handle it is fine. I don't think right now that this arrangement is giving us an adequate amount of time or even discussion about, about the roof, but that's just my opinion. So however you want to handle it, you're the majority. So go right ahead. Uh, Linda? Yes, I'm reading it. We can really just take out the solar panel piece and then review it. I mean, they okay. all 90% about the roof. Okay. Diane. I don't feel comfortable going into a vote immediately without reconsideration and discussion again about the roof specifications that are the choices that we have. I, I don't remember everything. I don't know. I wouldn't know what to say as far as yes or no. So I would like a little bit more information. It doesn't have to be detailed. But I would like to hear it. Uh, when you say hear it, are you referring to what Linda's talking about right now? Yes, at least okay. that. That would be at least. I mean, if you wanted to look back at your notes from last week, if you went to the executive summary, that might be detailed enough, which would give um, an example of all the different uh, failures. Is this the one that was on page 139 of our packet, which was summary of possible roof actions? I think that was the good, the, uh, it, was, it was a good start. You probably can't at, see it. I'm looking at last month's, actually. It's page three, four, five. Okay, I have to go get it. Yeah. Uh, okay. It just talks about the moisture that's trapped, the building is in the diff six different roof areas, you know, all the different um, issues that they found within all the different um, sections of the roof. And then it okay, can you say what you're looking at again, please? Sure. It's called an executive summary. From um, last month? On the B, yeah, B, it was uh, page 
five, six, page five and six. And that's where the good, best, better, and best is located. It's under the B. Right. Yeah, I see it. I, I see page five, six, and seven. But um, you can read it so we can vote up, figure out what we're going to say instead of. Um, I mean, that pretty much went through all the different things that they had found. And it describes the good, better, and best. And if we took out the pieces about the solar, because yes, I, under, I, I agree with the mayor that that was kind of like maybe our driving. So it's good to revote to make sure that that's stripped from our vote. I, I understand. Um, we want to make sure that we are very clear with the vote. Um, and that isn't... Um, Painting our decisions or our vote. So then, you know, if we want to relook, this definitely still give their thoughts. Um, it still tells you what needs to be done based on the insulation, what they've seen, what they've viewed. Um, but you just have to take off that piece about the solar because maybe mm -hmm. that. Um, guiding our decisions. Does everyone still have that? That executive summary from last month? It's on page, as Linda no. mentioned, it's on page five and six. And I then there's also a chart it. on page 139, which listed My, the summary of possible roof actions. I don't still have it. And I have one question. First of all, could somebody read it? And second, did best and uh, and the second one, the middle one, both have the uh, elevator shaft involved, or was it just the best? We no, we the elevator shaft we voted on separately. That was a separate item, and it it wasn't contingent. Okay, as long as this on... doesn't affect the elevator shaft situation, fine. Yeah. Because okay. I think that's a, a something that has to be dealt with personally. All right, all right. Well, it actually. So, it actually is in the butter. It does say it in there too about the elevator shaft because it says this option does not address any plan for the installation of rooftop solar panels, nor does it address the potential for removing the elevator shaft. And yeah, but I, I, what I mean is it, it doesn't really say that this includes the elevator. It just says it doesn't address it at all. Right. right. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. All right, Linda, do you want to just read those sections since some people don't have it? It's not that long. The better and the best? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the um, for the better, BEC's better recommendation is to strip... Well, don't you want to start with the good? I can start with the good if you'd like. Okay. Okay. Um, for the good, section 3.05... BEC's minimum recommendation, good, for maximizing the service life of the library roof is to remove and replace any wet installation and refurbish the roof area seams. In addition, if the elevator tower can be removed, it should be removed and covered over with new roof material. It is our opinion these actions will extend the existing roof service life to at least 10 years assuming routine inspections and maintenance are performed. Our recommendation does not address any addre address energy cons conservation, warranty, or any other consideration except for extending service life of the ex existing roof covering as no significant amount of water infiltration was discovered. An alternate to this approach is to coat the entire roof surface with a coating that is compatible to the roof membrane material. This option does not address any plan for installation of solar panels to the roof surface or address the removal of the elevator shaft. This option is estimated to cost approximately $3 per square foot of low slope roof area, $143,000, and provide an extension of five years to the ex estimated remaining service life of each roof area. Okay, now we're going to the better, 3.06.
BEC's better recommendation is to strip the existing roof membrane from the base installation, remove any wet installation, and insulation to meet the minimum energy code R-30 and adhere a new ketone ethylene ester single ply thermos thermoplastic membrane to the roof surface. This project would enlist the new roof system with a manufacturer warranty of periods up to 30 years. This option would enhance the energy savings potential of the building through the improved roof insulation. This option does not address any plan for the installation of rooftop solar panels, nor does it address the potential for removing the elevator shaft. This option is estimated to cost approximately $15 per square foot of low slope roof area, estimated $600,000. Now moving to the best 3.07, BEC's best option recommendation would be to remove the entire roof assembly to the structural deck. This would allow any deteriorated deck to be removed and replaced, a new vapor air barrier installation, new insulation to meet the current energy code, and a new roof membrane. This option will allow for the longest manufactured warranty periods, the best opportunity to plan for roof level solar array insulation, and the most extensive opportunity to improve the facility for long term. This option does not address removal of the elevator shaft. This option is estimated to cost approximately $2,250 per square foot of low slope roof area, equating to $900,000. Okay, Patty? It, you didn't mention the amount of warranty on that. It says better warranty, but it doesn't say how much, where the be uh, best, or I mean, excuse me, the better said 30 year, when you read it, this one, when you read it, didn't say. The best, I, I, I'm pretty sure the best he said it was 30 years. Yeah, but you said 30 years when you were reading the one for better, if I heard you correctly. To the project would listen new roof system with a manufacturer of periods up to 30 years was better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, so what is it only? Can I ask, is it only the best solution that would cover a warrant that would cover a warranty for the entire roof, right? So, but the better would not, it wouldn't be, would have different warranties. Different year warranties would the better be? I cannot not explain this. Well, I think the difference was the best was going all the way to the structural deck. Right. So uh, that's definitely it was everything. Just removing the wet insulation, it wasn't actually going all the way down to the deck, mm -hmm. which then would not give us that full warranty and making sure that everything was completely up to code. Com completely redone to the perfection of basically kind of brand, brand new roofs, where it would all be the same for all the five roofs that we have. Okay, that's the best. That's my point of view. I don't know, Greg, maybe you want to say, give us your input. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I did ask um, when we were uh, discussing this report initially, was uh, what kind of warranty we could expect with the uh, with the best option, and it turns out that um, the best option warranty could could be is 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 dependent upon the thickness of the membrane that is put onto the roof. So, you know, if you know if you increase the thickness of the membrane, um, and I can't remember what the thicknesses actually were. Uh, but maybe you could have a 40-year uh, warranty, for example. Um, if you had materially less, you know, it might be a 20 or a 25-year warranty. Um, and I would I would think that that was the same. Uh, the same was true with the better option as well. Um, uh, you know, you, you you say if you double the size, 
or the double the thickness of the membrane, it's got to be double the cost. But that's not that's not the case. It's um, it's really not that much more expensive to have a significantly thicker membrane on on the roof. Um, you know, something like ten thousand dollars maybe for the entire roof. But that's uh, that's my recollection. Thanks for that. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is go around just like I did um, at our December 6th library board meeting and informally, and this isn't your, this isn't a vote, but just informally ask each person what they would like to do, so it's called for a vote, uh, whether they would like to stick with the best uh, or change it to some other recommendation. And depending upon what the majority seems to want, uh, I may ask then for a motion to reconsider or, or not, depending on um, how it looks. So, um, would anyone like to start off? All right, I'm not seeing any hands here. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Becky. No. I'll start off. Um, uh, the question is whether we want to have another vote or what we think we would do. Uh, the question is what you think you would like to do with a rough. Not, not whether we want another vote at this point, but just sort of generally what it is you'd like to see happen. What better, best, or good, better, or best? I think I still feel like the best option is what's best for the library. Uh, going back to what I said the first time, I feel like it's like somebody took a bunch of different jigsaw boxes, threw them up in the air, and they landed on the top of the library. And they don't, they don't go. Um, if it was my own home, I would tear that all off because that would give me the best new opportunity, the best new roof to protect everything that was inside instead of trying to jam pieces together that really don't belong together. So that's how I feel. Okay. All right. I see a couple of hands. I, I think Linda's hand was up first. I'll come back to you, Omer, in just a minute. Okay. Um, I agree with Becky just because I'm looking at the prices for $15 for the better um, recommendation, there's only a $7 difference, $7.50 difference. For $7.50 per square foot, you get the best option to do a tear off to allow for a deteriorated deck to be removed compared to not is, again, a no-brainer for me. Um, $7.50 per square foot, I think, is just the best recommendation to take. So I still would, yes, go with the best. Thank you. Okay, Omer? So I want to comment now. I'm, I'm the one who obviously asked for the revote, And the reason I asked for the reconsideration, the reason I asked for the reconsideration is that I want, I want to make sure that we go on record saying that we considered this issue separately from the solar panel issue now that we re revisited the solar panel issue. That being said, I am a strong proponent of the idea that you get what you pay for. Um, if you buy, if you do a patchwork job, um, you'll eventually have to pay for it later and more likely than not, the overall cost is gonna be higher. So if you ask the question, what's the overall cost gonna be to the library over the next 30 years? I think if we did say the good version now, we would end up finding out that we're gonna have to go back to the best version in 10 years anyway. So you're gonna end up spending more money at the end of the day. If you were to just kind of get it all done as best as you can now, given that that money cannot be used for anything else and it's already there and already allocated, under those circumstances, I believe that going with the best option is still the proper thing to do. However, I agree with Carolyn, now that we're considering this issue separately, I think it's important to go on record. And I, I still, despite this position, would like to have another vote. Simply okay, I understand what you're saying, Amir. Okay, I, I understand that. And we, we can circle back to that. I just okay. want to finish going around the, uh, the room here. Uh, does anyone else want to speak at this time? Um, Patty, Diane, Carolyn? Then, then I'll speak up uh, if you're thinking. Uh, personally, I arrived at my decision that we should go with the best. I voted for the best rough last time. 
And I, in my mind, made that decision regardless of the solar. I, I wanted to do the best regardless of the solar option. And so I, I would stick with that. Um, but I do want to give uh, Patty, Diane, and Carolyn an option to, uh, an opportunity to say whatever they wanted. Diane, I see your hand up. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I'm going to stick with uh, going with the best because um, personally, as was said, if I had to choose for my own house, I would do that for sure. The idea of having everything just completed, finished, brand new, and all up to code is very attractive according, uh, despite its cost. I think it's quite costly, but I think it's important that it'll, it'll have a warranty across the board. So that's my choice. Okay. Uh, well, Mayor? Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing that I, I just thought of, um, which is that if we go with the best option, then if an opportunity presents itself in the future to say, you know, so the, the cost of going solar comes down, uh, that will be an option. Okay. If we don't, right. then that may not be an option. Okay. Uh, Patty, I see your hand. Yes, I agree with the mayor. I, I, everything he said about, uh, for example, the good, in the report Linda read too, it said they say five years. But even if it goes to 10, you're going to have to revisit it then. And to me, you might as well go with the best now. And this way you can also get rid of the shaft, which they said was a big problem. Okay, Caroline. Okay, um, the reason I suggested that we revisit the, um, the, the condition of the roof and our decisions to go with the $900,000 roof replacement was because I thought now some solar panels were not part of the equation that we could now do a comparative with what exactly is wrong with the roof, what needs to be fixed, and look at that in terms of dollars. When you go through these reports, and he was extremely detailed, anything he found is minuscule and minor, and he repeats it and repeats it and repeats it gave us an option for $143,000 to replace the membrane, which is a great solution, and then just take care of the, um, the minor uh, repairs. They're not even repairs. They're more like maintenance issues. Again, we would get 10 years out of this roof. The membrane could add another five years, but 10 years out of a roof, we don't know what we're doing right now in the middle of a pandemic. And as far as money being in special reserves, that money is spent on the building in its entirety. We could certainly, should we make some mega change after this pandemic, use it for the library and maybe what our plans are in the future. It won't go to waste, but for us to put a $900,000 roof that, that doesn't even justify the, the minimal amount of damage that we have. Sure, you can get a 20, 30 year uh, warranty if you spend $900,000, but we certainly can't justify that. His reports don't even indicate that. And I mean, it, it's okay. gonna look pretty, Carolyn, but I don't think that's logical. So Carolyn, uh, I take it your vote is still for the good approach, is that correct? Yes, I'm Thanks. still just to do the repairs. Okay. All right. Fine. And Greg, you seem to want to add something. Yeah, I just want to uh, be clear that the good approach for one hundred and forty-three thousand dollars does not include a new membrane. It uh, it includes resealing uh, the existing membrane. You know, at the points where uh, the different sections come together. So, or, what would the new membrane cost? Well. Uh, uh, a new membrane isn't uh, introduced. A new membrane isn't introduced until the better option, which is, if uh, if I recall, a, a six hundred thousand uh, dollar option. Uh, so and I'm sorry. 
What was his uh, recommendation for the membrane then? I thought he said, or was it a coating that he said we would put across the membrane? So um, there was, a, it, it seemed like there was an either or um, where they can individually seal the um, Right. Uh, the right. seams or reseal the seams, inspect them and mm -hmm. do whatever they have to do to refurbish them. Um, right. Or uh, coat, you know, put a coating on the entire roof, uh, which as I understand it would be like painting the roof um, with a coating that would be um, consistent with the, uh, with the, with the membrane that's already up there. Right. Right. Okay. okay. But, it does not, mentioned... but it does not include, it does not include a new membrane. But All right. the, you know, but um, he did unless, mention unless, coating it would strengthen it and we would still get 10 years. So um, it's still right. a viable option for our problem. All right, I'm gonna take one more comment from uh, Linda who has her hand up and, and then we need to move very, along and I'm, I'm gonna ask for a vote, which I will outline. Go ahead, Linda. Very briefly, just for the community to understand, maybe they haven't looked through our packet, but just to, um, to reply to Carolyn's and this is our roof. There are drain piles. There are pictures of pooling. There are pictures of repairs. There's pictures of more ponding. There are problems with seams everywhere. Yeah. These people have went and shown us pictures of, I have many, there's, there's pages and pages of pictures of problems. This is not just a little repair that we need. This is not, we are not acting, not due diligent for our community. We are being very, very fiscally responsible by possibly getting the best option for the library. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, we need to move along. I have to I need to. All right, Carolyn. I have to respond. Right. Carolyn, no, um, I think we've No, I'm up. sorry. While the Car pictures Karen, are wonderful to look at, you need to read the descriptions. And All move on. All right, all right, that's it. Uh, what we need to do is have a resolution of this issue. And everyone's had an opportunity to say several that things about incorrect. this. That is incorrect. Carolyn, Carolyn incorrect. I have what? to move this meeting along. You've had a chance to comment about it, as has everyone else. So at this point, I'm going to ask for this motion. I'd like to ask for a motion to reconsider the de decision of the December 6, 19, excuse me, 2020 board meeting regarding the roof and instead to indicate that the board votes to adopt the best approach as recommended by BEC for repairing the roof to adopt the best approach for addressing the elevator problem as recommended by BEC, but to not place any solar panels on the roof. Do I have such a motion? Patty? Yes. And Becky, are you making a second? Yes. Okay, all right. Now, are there any questions or comments on that motion? Carolyn. But you are on mute. Hopefully I won't be muted again. Before we make a motion, all comments are supposed to be heard and you had no right not to allow me to correct Trust you're, like, Ryan. you're talking right now. I'm letting theory. you talk, but we do have okay. to move along. The pictures, the pictures are showing the lack of maintenance done by the library that caused pooling and ponding due to natural debris, which means leaves and cracked and cracked sealant that needed to be replaced. These are not major damages requiring a nine hundred thousand dollar roof. It says okay, so. Okay. Thank in you. Written thank you. All right. We have to move along. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank All you. Right. Cindy, would you please call the roll? Okay. Just a second. Um, Patty. Yes. Linda. Yes. 
Karen? Yes. Carolyn? No. Becky? Yes. Diane? Thumbs up. Yes. Um, yes. Omer? Yes. Okay, that's everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I hope that will serve the purpose of indicating what the board's decision is in light of this new information and to make it clear that we are not pursuing the solar option anymore, but that the rest of our decision uh, has not changed. Do we need this? Uh, do you, Greg or Susan, need any further clarification on that decision? Okay. All right. Thank you. So let's move to the next thing on our agenda, which is the trustee reports. Um, the president is listed first on the agenda. I have two things to report on very quickly. Uh, this past weekend, uh, Monday, actually, I attended the annual legislative breakfast, uh, virtually this year, unfortunately. I've gone to it in person uh, many years in a row, and I always enjoyed that. It was not quite as enjoyable doing it virtually, but we did get to hear a number of legislators address us. And, and I was I'm not surprised, but it did confirm my uh, belief that the library is particularly important to our seniors, especially during the pandemic. A number of the legislators mentioned that their constituents called and said how important the library was to them, and especially to seniors. Um, you know, I think children have the schools that, you know, give them a chance to learn and use technology. People in the workforce learn and use technology in the workforce, but our seniors, a library is really what they need. And, and, and that's why we're, we're just so especially important to them during this time. So that's one thing I wanted to report on. Another thing I wanted to report on is an event that I attended and um, it was a virtual event, the Great Migration and the Great War was a speaker that we had on February 8th. His name is Clarence Goodman. This guy was fabulous. He was really excellent. I don't know how we got this guy as a speaker, but he was terrific. It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, if you have an opportunity to hear him, he's gonna give another presentation on another topic. Uh, I think later this month or maybe next month, I encourage you to tune in because he was really, uh, an excellent speaker and, and presented uh, a very fine program. So that's my report. Um, do other trustees have any report that they'd like to present? All right, I don't see any at this time, so I'll turn to our trustee. What about Patty. mine? Oh, Patty, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I said, what about mine? Basically, I wanted to do the treasurer's report. If somebody oh. else had something to report before that, fine, go for it. All right, Carolyn, did you have a, a trustee report? Trustee comment, yes. Um, I want to thank um, Susan, was it, who sent us the Rails onboarding video. I did get to view that. And um, I um, found Alex Todd, I guess the director of the Prospect Heights Library. Very interesting. He offered a, an, a detailed perspective for libraries that I've never heard. So if you haven't listened to it, you definitely should um, take the time to. It was really informative. Okay, thank you. Um, Patty, would you like to proceed with the treasurer report? If everybody else is okay, I am. This is, this is the report for January, the seventh month of the fiscal year, 58% through the year. Revenue investment income was 105%. Total revenue was at 41%. Expenditures was at 62. Total library materials, 55. Total op uh, library operation expenditures was at 40%. General administration was at 53%. Total employees fringe was at 61%, utilities at 50%, building and equipment was at 31%, total expenditures was at 46%. Now, 
Um, the checks that I looked at this month, majority of them were not the ones we pay monthly that were our high. Um, the Children's Plus was for, uh, which was check number 79514, uh, I believe, was for books. Uh, check 79585, uh, uh, let's see, Cooperative uh, Computer Service is, um, God, paid quarterly. I'm sorry, trying to read my own writing here. Uh, check 79615, Midwest Tape varies per month. It's for video, audio, and online stuff. 79620, downloadables. Um, it was for overdrive. Uh, 79623 was uh, for mailing of the newsletter. 79608 was for Klein, Thorpe, and Jenkins. And that was for 3606 dollars uh, and 67 cents of which $2,792 was for the lawsuit. The amount for the lawsuit is not totally been billed to us yet because of we received, we received their bills towards the end of the month. So we should have still more for the lawsuit next month. I'm assuming, I don't know how much. Um, oh, you can tell us that then. Yes. Uh, the Ingram's library service is also for books and that was 79602. Hellet movers. This I asked Greg about because they, I'm thinking movers. Uh, the cards they use because of COVID to isolate the books and things that are turned in, they get from this moving place. And so there's a fee and supposedly we're not having to keep them for as long a time without being circulated. So that fee should go down. Um, let's see, where are we now to 79640. Visiograph is for the printing of the newsletter. 79642 was for web link. And I'm trying to remember, that was web stuff, wasn't it, Greg? I don't remember exactly what that was. I didn't uh, write it. Yeah, web links is, is the company that the board approved to uh, redo the uh, library's That's, website. Thank you. Memory's good, but short. Uh, 79644. Landers plowing and salting. We shouldn't have to explain that one. We don't do that in-house, so we have to hire somebody to do that for us. And with this winter, it, you know, you have to keep things salted and plowed. And I believe that was my last one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Patty. Any questions about uh, Patty's report? Carolyn. Yeah, if we can go back to the financial reports first, I had a couple of questions there um, on the, the um, income statement, the consolidated income statement. Um, what page are you on, Carolyn? Page six, page six total salaries. Uh, I'm showing that there was a monthly increase of total salaries for $26,703. There's my Where's my page? I was wondering if Susan could help us understand that. Or Greg, whoever prepared this. Yeah, I, I'm, our, we are going to overspend on the salaries this year. We had um, made our best estimate at what we were going to need due to the pandemic, and we cut it pretty sharply. And as it turns out, it, 
Um, this is taking a long time. Staff is on a team structure and uh, part of where the overage is, is deciding to have greeters in the front to be helping people find their materials and um, making sure everybody is masked. So I, all I can say is we did not estimate that correctly and it is going to go over for the year, unfortunately. So Susan, what you're saying is we're hiring additional people as no. readers. No, no, no. We're not hiring anybody. It's just that staff that normally wouldn't be working are taking those greeter shifts and so they're being paid for them. So it's an additional position, which we didn't usually have. That's why the budget is going over. Yeah, you over. could say that, right. And you know, because of the team structure, somebody might be working four days this week and no days next week. So this gives them the opportunity to work some time in the following week. So it's just ending up being more money than we had anticipated. And then we also have had a number of staff with medical conditions that have been out. We've had to use some subs that we did, were not anticipating. I thought in a pandemic, you wouldn't need any subs and that turned out to not be true. Okay, so it, well then it's additional, it's additional staff. That makes sense. Cause I know you commented last month that salaries will increase because people are using their sick days or something. And, and I couldn't understand, well, what difference does it make it still the same, but not if we're adding, you know, like you need extra people or more hours. I get it. Okay, well, that takes care of that one. And then my second one was software and licenses is on page seven. And what I noticed is there's actually zero for the um, actual for the month. But when I went into... Um, let me see. Oh, the visa bill had um, over $600 worth of software licenses. So my concern was, um, I understand we used a credit card for numerous things, but how do those costs get applied to the line item that they pertain to? In this case, if there's zero monthly expenses for licenses, but there was over 600 on the visa card. Is that something you do later? No, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the charge. Can you direct me to the charge on the visa that you were? Uh... Oh, there's numerous. Um, I just ran down the line of the visa bill. Um, that would be in the check section. Well, I could see here that there's an IT one. That is a different fund. Uh, one you were looking at is uh, for patron facing things. The IT one is a separate line. So, so technology from the tech department wouldn't be included in that line item, is that it? So from tech, the, that is what would be included in that line, but the IT services licenses are a different line. And okay, so then that's, that's exactly what they are. There's digital services, there's IT. So are, how are those categorized then? Like, are they in a department budget line item since they're not software? Well, they're different. I mean, the patron facing things are in, I think, the library operating expenditures, maybe. And the IT ones come out of a different line. Okay. And the budget line item is for patron items. Is that what you so, said? So let me, um, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at... Um, in a, re, in a report where I would expect to see this charge, Carolyn, um, I'll have to get back to you on this specifically. Okay, I just just wanted to understand what that line item was for and, and, yeah. and why I'm- Yeah, and so do I. Okay, I appreciate it. All right, and then um, as far as checks go, um, oh, I have a few here. Okay, um, all right, Kleinthorpe and Jenkins, which Patty already addressed was um, over $3,000 and I am aware the lawsuit is over, although I understand as well, there will be more costs probably um, occurring because we're built quite a few months um, behind. But what I do wanna say is um, I'm glad the lawsuit's over. Um, I have to say the compelling message out of this elongated process, I mean, I feel like it's been two years that this um, issue has been actually tearing, I think, our community apart. Um, I know there were residents interested in 
term limits. And for some reason, I get Susan has a position as an electoral direct, uh, uh, whatever director, um, and she needs to look into this and, and, and she made a decision, but I would think our trustees and our director together collectively, I would have rather seen us try to recognize the fact it's an issue in the community and reach out to the residents in some dialogue format rather than have this, it's, it's just blown up and mushroomed and caused so many ill feelings. But I'm just grateful it's over. Um, and then I had a couple questions about uh, the checks. Um, Anderson Locke, I noticed- uh, Can I just reply to that? Had a lot of, yeah, not let, right let me just- yeah. But, yeah. uh, Linda, um, Anderson uh, Locke, on uh, page 11. Well, well Carolyn, um, Carolin, I'm going to let Linda it, reply. No, I'm sorry. It is blown up no. because of misinformation. It is blown up because of misinformation. No. And no uh, excuse me, she can talk later. Karen, you have no, the control. All right, you've been talking for a Without while allowing, now. allowing interruptions. I'm going to give Linda an opportunity to speak. You can continue really? on with you your Really? Don't give me an opportunity. Then. I think if we listen to a tape of this meeting, you'd be speaking more than any of the other trustees. Not the so point. I'm going to give Linda an opportunity to speak. Linda. All I had to say, it was misinformation. And no, it is not the huge amount of community that wanted this done. And it was based on misinformation on why they wanted term limits. Thank you very much what was actually in the paper that was misinformation. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, term limits were requested by taxpayers because that's right, what they Karen, want. There's no misunderstanding. One, one taxpayer. Uh, one. What we're doing one. right now Oh, you're out of your mind. You signatures. Financial okay, statements. Okay, can I ask my questions? If you have a question about the financial statements. I do, but you caused this uprising. Yeah, you so, caused the uprising. Go Karen. ahead and ask any question Thank you, you have about Thank the financial you. statement. Anderson Locke, as I repeated before, page 11, we had a repair for 533.50. I was wondering if this was an exterior lock due to the horrific weather conditions. Is that something um, you might recall? I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, but I know I do know that from time to time um, we have uh, locks uh, fail for, uh, from uh, from usage, and that Dave has to uh, get a new lock set and replace it. So this could be an exterior door. Is that possible? Uh, it's, I mean, I'm yeah, it's possible. About... I I don't know. Okay. All right, that's fine. And then I noticed under Garvey's there's a trusty expense. For ninety-eight seventy-three, I wasn't sure what that was for, so I thought I'd ask. Um, it should not have been under Garvey's. It should have been under the Illinois Library Association, I think. I'm trying to think any reason that would have come out of Garvey's. The trustee expense um, was for the. Um, no, that was these were sixty. I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that. All right, and then my That's last me. one is. Oh, sorry. Uh, my last okay. one is my last one is journal topics. It says a legal publication. I think it was five hundred dollars. Do we know what that was for? Yeah, that was to post the uh, annual operating uh, uh, statement in the okay. uh, journal. All right. I thought it. All right. I thought it was something else. Okay. And then Susan, I had a question about. You know, back up for these checks, we used to have this little box in our um, meeting room. Are they uploaded um, electronically by any chance or do you still just house backup in paper form? So right now, um, all of the uh, backup is in paper form and it's in paper files in traditional file cabinets. What we have been doing over the last, uh, I'd say uh, four or five weeks is looking at firms that would that provide software to upload um, uh, these paper uh, these pieces of paper into an electronic format that's easily retrievable. Um, as you might imagine, um, that's quite an undertaking, and we plan to have some numbers for the board to review at the next meeting. 
So our current copying machines don't have that scanning capability to upload them into our software? No, program? it's one th it's one thing to uh, scan something and put it on a file um, somewhere. It's quite another thing to uh, be able to retrieve it. So the retrieval piece is the piece that's trickier. And um, so what you have to do in that process is to assign what are called meta tags uh, to the various pieces of paper. So if, for example, you wanted to see uh, an invoice from Garby's, um, you could just type in a search for Garby's and that um, that invoice would be returned to you. Um, if you just if you just do it on a um, on a scanning bed and then stick it in a file, you'd have a much harder time retrieving it. So how would you be scanning it with this new software? Not on a scanning bed? It would be or scan a scanning. It would be sorry, go ahead. It would be scanned on a scanning bed, of course, um, but it would be scanned into a software that has a template uh, already waiting for it where it can identify key pieces of information, which then turn into meta tags. Okay, so currently we don't have that option, but you're looking into it. Okay, that's great. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, that is all I have. Okay, fine. Uh, next on our agenda is payment of the bills. Do I have a motion to approve uh, operating expenditures of $207,037.95 and payroll expenses of $288,547.59 for a total monthly expense of $495,585.54. Do I have a motion to pay those bills? Motion. I have a motion from uh, Diane and second from Patty. Okay. Uh, Cindy, would you take a roll call? Yes. Um, Diane? Yes. Omer? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? No. Becky? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, now we'll move to the director's report. Uh, Susan, uh, earlier I suggested that uh, you might want to just go over with us the Excel sheet you, pre you uh, prepared regarding expenditures from the Special Reserve. But given the lateness of the hour, I suggest perhaps you do that next month, yeah. uh, since there's no time nothing time sensitive about that, although it is an interesting document. And I have some questions about it later on. Um, and go directly to other things that uh, you need to tell us about now. Um, yes, okay, I wanted to uh, let the board know that um, I, I had mentioned last month that we hadn't yet received our CARES money from Cook County. It did finally come. So we got our $5,000 that offset some of the cost of the uh, protective equipment that we had. I, I think a lot of it went to the plexiglass shields and PPE and wipes and things like that. So that has been received. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, we do have three major, sort of major capital projects coming your way in the next two months in the board packet. So just giving you a, the, a little bit of a heads up on that. Um, we are going to be replacing our phone system. So you're going to be receiving that in the, in the uh, meeting next month. And I assure you that we will um, assess what our needs are and make sure that we're getting the best value possible. And I'm sure we're using pre-bid. Um, uh, we also will be bringing you a uh, uh, the sign out in front. We've been alerted by Karen, I think, passed something to me. A number of patrons have mentioned that the light, the sign is missing some of the letters and things like that again. So um, it is going to be time for doing a more significant overhaul of it because we're spending quite a bit of money repairing it. And it needs, it needs to be, it's very visible for us. But it needs to be working appropriately. And then the third thing is that we are looking into security um, going with a key swiping system on our interior doors, because right now anybody can walk through any of our doors unless they are locked. So um, we're going to try to move away from the physical keys and go with a security system. So we'll be bringing that to you as well. These are all things that you 
have heard about before in the capital plan, but, um, but I just wanted to let you know they're coming. Um, Karen asked me to talk a little bit about what we're planning in terms of life getting back to normal, um, which is certainly a pleasant thing to think about. Um, one thing that is getting a little bit closer to normal is that the uh, rails announced just today that the quarantine period um, for putting materials that are returned aside uh, for three days, it is going down to 24 hours. So we are very happy about that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the carts that Patty mentioned will be able to return a bunch more of the carts. So <laughs> that is good news. Um, so that is one example of life getting a little bit back to normal. And that's because they've done the study and they can just see that transmission of the virus really just does not tend to come to people touching things. Um, I am surveying the staff um, later this week on what their sort of pain points are in terms of dis, uh, getting away from the team system because our COVID rates are so low at this point. You know, just for yesterday, the this Plains COVID rate, seven day positivity rate was 4.62. Niles is all the way down to 2.96. Um, Park Ridge, 3.2. Morton Grove, 1.86. So um, I think the, the risk from patrons and from each other is gone way down. But I still wanna, I, I know there, there are so many people that are very anxious about, um, about being in contact. One of the things I know is going to be an issue is that some of the work rooms are just too small to get a six foot distance between people. So it would involve very careful scheduling of the bodies in the building. So we probably would go from four teams to two teams first and see how that works out. Um, but that, uh, you know, but I, I first want to hear back from the staff if there's anything that they would like to see us do before we do that. Um, we have begun uh, asking people to report if they have been vaccinated to our HR person. I don't find out who has been vaccinated. I just want to know the percentage of the staff that has been vaccinated. So that will make a difference in terms of our being able to have more staff in the building at the same time and then be able to do more of our normal things. Patty? They aren't considered 1A or 1B, are they? Do no. we have many that are? Uh, no, there are people, there are a couple that work in medical settings. There, um, okay. there are, there are, I, I don't, I don't actually know how many, cause we just started this, but, um, but yeah, they're just supposed to be giving us kind of a, well, she will be, she will know specifically who has gotten vaccinated, but all I will know is, you know, what departments and how many people. So that will also factor in, um, cause I think it's really important to balance the state picture, and the state guidelines with the, the immediate, the, the granular detail from our own particular area. Um, let's see, we, we are planning tentatively to start having some in-person programs in the building this summer. Uh, we will go with a hybrid model first where we will have just a handful of people here physically present and then we'll be Zooming the uh, two out, people out in the houses. So hopefully that will, um, you know, start getting things a little bit more to normal. We really would like to be able to do some of our summer reading things for kids, you know, face to face, because that's very different for kids. And uh, so we're hoping to do that. We definitely are doing a summer reading program now. Um, the number one thing we're looking for is for the, um, our area to go into phase five, where they, you know, significant numbers of people are vaccinated, the hospitals are not having a lot of cases, things like that. So those are the kinds of things I'm factoring in. I wish I could say definitively, in two weeks, we're gonna do this. In three weeks, we're gonna do that. Uh, the other thing we are talking about is what we could do that would um, uh, be a significant thing to the patrons to, to help improve things. And, and so one thing we were talking about is perhaps reopening our fireplace room, um, just you know, letting people sit in there because it's such a beautiful space. And I kind of, you know, it's their building. I would like them to be able to use their building. So we're gonna to try to find some smaller safe things that we can begin restoring and just kind of gradually expand on those. But you never want to be in a position where you go, okay, here you go, and then snatch it back again. So that's that's where we are. Um, I think that was all I had for you for now. Okay. Any questions uh, regarding the director's report? I want to have our meetings in the fireside room. <laughs> and we can go you back. You know, it is a it is a nicer space than the boardroom. I have to say, you're right. Yes, Carolyn. I had one question for Susan. I was looking at technical services, the stats 
but I wasn't understanding them. There are three columns. It's on page 31. Yes. And I was wondering if you could help me understand that I'm looking at ordered, received, and then input, and I'm not sure what I'm seeing. Yeah, you are the second person to ask me that. And I think the confusion comes in, in that libraries have had technical services departments since, you know, the 50s and 60s. They have nothing to do with technology, but they are the people that do all of the materials, ordering, cataloging, processing. So inputting is a step in the processing. It's like the thing that gets that happens right before it goes out of the, of the department. So in June, they ordered 2,585 items. Could be a book, a DVD. It could be the early literacy kits that were mentioned in my report. Could be any one of the things that have been ordered. Then, so they order them first, then they come in the building, they have to be received. You have to match up the orders with the receipts. And then input is like the thing that happens right before they come out. So it's really a measure of the flow of work in the department. Um, Cindy actually uh, oversees that supervisor. So she might be able to answer any more specific questions. Yeah. Okay, because the specific question I have is we ordered 2,585, but we received 5,653. Yeah, because there was a big wave of ordering when we came oh, back. Backlog? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I just make sense. And I get the input uh, portion of it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we, we were thinking um, about changing the name of that department because it just is too confusing these days with <laughs> things being meaning technology. So, yes. We're yes. Yeah. Thank um, you. Susan, I had mentioned that to you too. And, yes, and you I have. think you were trying to think of a clever name for that because. It's confusing. Yes. Diane. Diane. Hi, I just want to give a shout out to Sasha because um, apparently he was interviewed for a very prestigious uh, award and he oh, will have uh, public. Yeah. Yes. Published. Uh, his interview will be published in the Marketing Library Services. It really is very special, and I just have to give uh, high marks for that. Congratulations, Sasha. We'll be sure he hears that. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, it doesn't appear as though we have any communications, uh, correct, uh, Susan? Um, yeah, I guess not which means that we should now move to new business. Of course, we already discussed 10A, where our discussion with Michael McTavish. So uh, let's move to 10B, which is the salary schedule for 21-22. Now, when we've had this type of discussion in the past, in past years, there's sometimes been some confusion, like, oh, we're, we're giving certain people salary increases or this is what the increase will be for this year. And that's really not what's going on here. What we're talking about is our structure of um, ranges for salary. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, Greg actually has a few things that he can explain about that to help you know, All right. understand okay. exactly what it is. All right. But when Greg's going to need to share his screen. There we go. Okay, so um, one of the things that um, uh, that I caught was a question on whether or not the library is required to have a salary schedule. And, um, you know, there are three points I want to bring up. Um, it's good management practice. Uh, this is so um, all employees understand the rules, in quotes, and, you know, uh, can understand what their how their compensation fits into the uh, organization overall. Uh, also, a uh, second point, the current salary schedules would show the uh, state if they ever decided to come in, if the Department of Labor ever decided to come in and do, uh, do an audit, that we're complying with the law, in particular, the minimum wage law um, that's, um, that's been out there for years and years and years. And then uh, the last thing I want to bring up is that um, the new standards uh, serving our public 4.0 standards for public, uh, excuse me, Illinois Public Libraries says very clearly that the library should have uh, not only a salary schedule, but job descriptions for all library positions, and they should be periodically reviewed and revised as needed. 
So um, having said that, I got um, just a couple of uh, slides with some data on them. Um, the first is a historical look back at the library's RAISE program. Um, as everybody on the board uh, that's been around for a while knows, the, the library typically has a 3% annual RAISE program. Uh, one year um, in 2014-15, uh, we had a 2.4% uh, percent RAISE program. And generally, we uh, benchmark this off of the um, off of the Illinois CPI, which is, uh, and then gross it up a little bit for uh, for merit. So, just to give you a sense of how the raise program relates to the state consumer price index, this orange line represents the progression of the uh, state CPI. And what it is, it's a, it's a simple uh, cumulative number of all of the years that preceded that particular point back to 2010. And then uh, the next bit of data on the following slide shows um, the library actual average hourly rate. So the way that we got this was to take all of the wages that were paid in a given fiscal year and divide it by the number of hours that are worked. Typically, uh, the library works um, or pays, I should say, around 140,000 hours a year. Sometimes it's higher and sometimes it's lower. Um, this, this past year in 2019-2020, uh, the uh, total number of hours we paid was uh, just under 140,000 hours. But you can see that it starts at, um, you know, it, it's, it starts at, at zero because it's the first year. And then we end up somewhere around, you know, 11 and a half uh, or so percent. And that's compared to what the raise program is um, accumulated over the 10 years, which is which would be just short of 30%. And then uh, again, what the uh, uh, what the state CPI is, which would be, you know, somewhere around uh, 18 or 19 percent. And again, the gray line is the growth in the um, in the hourly or the change in the hourly wages. So what this says is that, yeah, even though you're raising the um, you're raising the uh, salary schedule, uh, it doesn't necessarily have an impact on on what the uh, actual pay people are receiving is. Um, that comes with the, uh, with the raise program. And because of turnover, uh, things like retirements, uh, for example, or people leaving to go to another job um, uh, or other sorts of terminations and then hiring replacements, we end up uh, going to a, um, a lower uh, per hour uh, uh, average rate. And then, you know, I, I thought at this point, it would be interesting to talk about what's on the horizon as far as uh, pay is concerned. And uh, what we see here is the Illinois minimum wage chart, which uh, comes directly from the state. Um, I've highlighted in gray, uh, the one 1121 and 22 uh, minimum wages, because that's the period that you know, that we're in now, and that's the period that'll be covered by the uh, uh, by the new salary schedule. So currently, as of one one twenty one, the minimum wage is eleven dollars, and then it goes up to twelve dollars uh, on the same date in uh, twenty twenty two. Ultimately, we get to fifteen dollars an hour in uh, twenty twenty five. Um, the importance of this and the problem that we need to start working on in the uh, in the near term is what does um, what do our lowest paid employees end up how does it affect the lower three or four tiers of of employees because the tier above the lowest is is below fifteen dollars so that'll automatically raise but they're because that we have different uh, different levels of uh, on the salary schedule, 
um, you start to experience some compression at the lower end of the range. So, um, you know, it wouldn't do for somebody, you know, three ranges up uh, to be paid exactly for the lowest person as as the lowest person in in the uh, in the organization just because they haven't been uh, affected by the new minimum wage. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm making um, I'm getting my point across exactly, but uh, you know if you think about it, you know pretty soon you have to start creating some sort of differential between somebody with zero experience and maybe somebody with five years experience and how does that look? And that'll definitely have an upward pressure on the amount that's, uh, that's paid to our employees as well as the uh, upward pressure on the uh, minimum wage. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the average wage that we pay year over year. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Greg, I think you've explained that pretty well. This isn't the first time we've addressed this issue. And I think what we're seeing here is what many, many businesses experience, especially those that hire people near the minimum wage. And when the bottom comes up, that, that of course, uh, compels you to raise not only those being paid minimum wage, but also those that are being paid perhaps a step or two above that, because otherwise they all end up being paid pretty much the same or very close to it. And, and, and it's not really fair to those people who have been here longer to be making almost the same bottom of the wrong amount that those newcomers are making. So I think we've understood that. And uh, but, but anyone who has any questions certainly uh, can voice those now. And I think uh, uh, Greg can, uh, can explain that. Um, so uh, we're looking at that as one reason why the salary schedule needs to be adjusted, but also due to inflation in general. And what we see on the proposed changes that is beginning on page 37, and well, we see it on th page 37 and 38 of our packet, is what the ranges are now, both it, that's in the black type phase, both annual and hourly, and what the proposed new ranges would be, both annual and hourly, ranging from a minimum to a maximum for each one of the positions that we have. Now again, Greg, uh, this does not raise any individual's salary by adjusting the scale. Um, am I correct? Yes. All, employed, all of our employees are still within their respective scales. Now, it certainly makes a difference if we're looking at hiring new people. This, this is something you have to look at the scale when you're deciding what salary you will offer a new person. Uh, but this change to our salary schedule doesn't in and of itself change the salary today of any existing employees. Oh, that's correct. Um, we will address that later when we decide, you know, what raises will we may give this year. Uh, but this this sets the range. This sets the range for what each position uh, will pay. And um, there is just one more thing, which is that um, the by policy, uh, I cannot offer a, a salary at over twenty five percent over the bottom without board approval. So mm -hmm. I can't I can't like start out somebody at the top of the range. They have to start out within 25% of the bottom of the range without coming to you, which I don't recall what we're doing, so. All right, thanks. Thank you for uh, reminding us of that, yeah. All right, now does, um, let's see, I suppose, first of all, we ought to get a, a motion, motion on uh, the table, and then we can discuss it a little bit. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the proposed salary schedule as set forth in page 37 and 38 of our board packet. Uh, Patty, uh, looks like you're making a motion. Yes. For a second. Uh, Diane, it looks like you just made a second for that. So we have this motion on the table. Does anyone have any questions or comments uh, that they'd like to voice regarding the uh, newly proposed salary ranges? 
Okay, I, I don't, uh, Diane, I think your hand went up first. Uh, yes, a uh, simple question. I Do we ever pay anybody more than the maximum or we are? We cannot, we're not allowed to. I don't know where the, no. I mean, we cannot, right? No, I mean, we have had a couple of people that have worked here so long and do such a great job that they've gotten really close to that point. But what happens to them is that they, um, they might get a bonus in place of a raise, but they they don't get a raise added onto their salary base. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, uh, Carolyn, was your hand up earlier? Yes, um, a couple things. Um, Karen, I think you said we'll talk about raises later, but I think these figures include the 1.4% CPI increase, correct? Um, so I there think, is a salary increase in here. Um, the, for the range, but I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, changing the schedule doesn't change any individual schedule. That doesn't, I mean, like if we pass this tomorrow, none of our employees are going to be suddenly making more money. They're not. Right. No, well, we're talking about the 2021-22 salary schedule, which right now does include a raise. So I just want to make sure we understand, yeah, this is an increase in salary, right, from what it is to what it's going to. Um, that's the purpose of approving it, correct? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's still possible that we could decide uh, that no one is going to get a raise this year. Uh, and with the exception of anyone who's affected by the increase in the minimum wage, uh, which we'd have to raise, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't really have to raise anyone. But what this does, it, it, I think the salary schedule certainly comes into play when you're hiring new people. And right. when you're hiring new people, you know, you have to place them somewhere within this range. Um, but for existing employees, what we're doing tonight doesn't really affect them, at least not directly. Yeah, we just don't want to get into a position where we give raises every year, but we don't adjust the salary schedule every year. And then all of a sudden, three years down the road, then we have to make a big shift on the salary schedule. It's much better to do it in small motions. Okay. Going so I just had a couple of questions. Okay, so I'm viewing this as the 2021-22 salary schedule, which is going to include salary increases by grade level. This salary schedule is actually a broad framework for including salaries by grade level. And then, of course, if Susan has new hires, it gives her something to follow. But I believe that this is a component of our budget and it's something we should discuss during the budget meeting as opposed to months earlier. Um, and also looking at this salary schedule definitely indicates that we have I think, five or six different levels and there's a salary range for each level. But if I need to approve what this 2021-22 salary schedule is actually going to cost because it does incur a cost. What I would need included would be all the staff by grade level and what they're making and what they'll be making in 21-22 so I can see a comparison because this is an increase in salaries and it's a lot more comprehensive than just a um, a, a salary schedule. So got, I, yes, outside. Hey, Addy, you want to put yourself on mute? So um, I'd like to just discuss this thoroughly during the budget meeting rather now because it's uh, it, that's actually where it belongs, but I would like additional information as well. So that's my take on, on this. I mean, we would be giving you that kind of information when you are looking at the salary line of the budget. This, I mean, just uh, kind of allows us to keep up with the minimum wage change. You have to, you have to change the schedule for the minimum wage part. That's already in effect even. This includes the minimum wage changes for 21, 22 and the 1.4 
percent CPI. So these are increases, and I think we should be able to look at it in its entirety. I mean, we have a hundred and I don't know twenty some employees, maybe we, more. We I'm have a hundred sure. now. We're down. To We're 100. down to a hundred. Okay, you know that th those are statistics that I would like to see instead of just you know a uh, a framework of of a, of grouping categories. And I think it's a discussion of, of, of information, of more detailed information than just this. But that's how Patty. I look at it. Patty? Isn't the main reason we're even considering talking about this because legally we're bound because of the fact that they're raising minimum wage? that's one reason we certainly do have to raise our minimum under our salary schedule so therefore if we raise the minimum don't we have to go accordingly up the schedule otherwise the people here are going to be like there like was said and uh, there we will have people who will say hell with this i'm not staying here and i'm going to find another job well, that, that is part of the rationale for, yes, adjusting those salary ranges so that people who have been here for a while do fall into a higher range, continue to fall into a higher range than those people who have just started who are making the new increased minimum wage. So, yes, that is something that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg or Susan, uh, I understand that all of our employees, with a possible exception of people who are making minimum wage, already fall within their salary schedule. Uh, that is, after we address adopt, let's say, assuming we address adopt these proposed ranges, all of our employees will still fall within the range, and that means their schedule, their salaries are not automatically raised. Uh, when and if we decide to give raises, then those individuals will get raises. But min merely because we adopt a salary schedule doesn't mean that any individual employee has their salary raised. That's, uh, that's a, different, a different motion, a different discussion. Patty. It technically, don't we have only, let's say, a handful, maybe five or six people that would really be affected by this because of where their salaries fall now? You mean the uh, minim people making minimum wage? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, the lower people, the lower- I um, think it's really just one at the moment. Yeah, okay. so, you know, at this point, changing this isn't really gonna affect what we're paying. Uh, it's just getting us prepared Instead of waiting until the year, they tell us, okay, minimum wage is now $15. And we're like, holy crap, we got to affect everybody fast. You know, we got to push ourselves harder to get to where the, the range or the range schedule should be. If we do it gradually, aren't we in better shape? I would think we are. Okay. Are there uh, questions from any other members of the board? Carolyn? I have a response. Um, you know, Karen, I'm looking at the 2020-21 salary schedule. And then I'm looking at the 2021-2022 salary schedule, which is what we're considering tonight. It is an increase in salaries. So we are voting on increasing salaries for 21-22. Irregardless of what we call this or how we view it, I would like to see detailed information of our staff by their grades to understand how many employees there are in those grades, what they're making, so I can see a total view of what we paid them last year and what we'll be paying them this year. And yes, we always talk about the, the staff, and there aren't that many at the lower end of the spectrum, but for some reason, we don't focus a lot on them. And, and I would like to see us take a more in-depth look at the salary structure by employee, because I think there's some room for some differences in the way we've been just automatically 
approving the schedule. That's why I'd like to see um, those details. Um, are there any other questions or comments, Dan? Dan. Um, yes. Okay. Um, for example, the Librarian of Youth Services 2418 is what is the lowest she can be paid, right? It doesn't mean that there's anybody getting that amount of money, right? This is just a guide. That's all this is, is, a, is guide. a guide. It is a guide. I mean, it is possible. Not, I don't know, but some of these positions may be vacant even. Yeah, it doesn't indicate what they're earning. They are earning something between 2418 and 3706. Precisely. Right. And, and the purpose of a salary schedule is to arrange. It's and, totally and, something that we should have in, in our policies and in our books. And then when the time for the budget comes, of course, we look at the, um, the actual salaries. This is just a okay. guide. It's no big deal. What, what we should have. All right, Linda, you had your hand up? Yeah, just to clarify, maybe I'd like to ask Susan, um, as our trustee um, position, is it our position to, um, it's not our position to set any salaries of any way. So we're fine for setting this proposed salary schedule. However, what Carolyn's asking for us to know every single person's salary, okay, yes, we could know that, but it's not our position to change it or push it in any way, because that's not our position. It's basically to set Susan's salary, um, but really no one else's. So I think that's really a moot point. Um, and um, it really is two different things that Carolyn's talking about. So just wanted to let the community understand our trustees position on this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else that had uh, anything they wanted to comment on? Carolyn? Um, my request for information by staff person on this grid explains how many employees are making that much in, or how many employees are making what grade level of salary. And then we'll be able to come up with the total cost. We'll be able to see who's getting a dollar an hour, who's not, and do we want to do something more? We did have a huge discussion at the last budget meeting, which I think just sprung up out of nowhere, where we just threw in another 40 grand for staff that work Sundays, then we stopped working on Sundays, so yes, we do, we do give Susan recommendations about how we should pay these salaries. I'm saying we should look at more details so we're more knowledgeable so we can have a discussion. So we've done this before. These conversations aren't new. Just want to explain that Trustee Ryan's example is wrong. And that is your opinion. Um, well, I call it micromanaging. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask uh, Cindy to uh, call a vote. There is a motion on the floor to approve the proposed salary schedule. So Cindy, would you please uh, give us a roll call? Yes. Um, Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Uh, no, I can't approve this. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Omira? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Cindy. All right, moving on to the next item. Uh, this is to review the Illinois Public Library Core Standards Governance and Administration Checklist and Personnel Checklist. Um, Susan, um, I do know it's 9.30. Um, is this something we should do now? And if so, about how long is this going to take? 
I think that, that we can go through this rapidly because I don't, I'm assuming that people have already read through these things. Uh, if you have questions about them, we can always put them on the agenda again next month. I certainly don't want to get into a long discussion about anything, but I thought what I would just do is um, flag the particular items that I think, uh, you know, we're supposed to show in the per capita grant that we are meeting or working toward meeting these standards. So I just wanted to flag a, a couple of things that where we might need to do a little bit more. Does that okay. sound good? Okay. All right. On the core standards, um, core number six, it says the library adopts and adheres to the public library trustee ethics statement. I don't believe the board has ever actually formally approved that. So I would suggest um, possibly in May with when the new board is being sworn in that that be part of that meeting. Okay. Uh, core 23, at least every five years and more frequently if necessary, the library conducts a review to determine if the library is providing facilities, collections, and services in a quantity at a time and in a manner that meets the needs of the community. Um, I guess you could just call that our strategic planning process, that it should be an element of that. And if you consider that to be yeah. that, then, then we're fine on that one too. So I think- uh, Remind us, especially the new people, when was our strategic plan? Um, what, uh, the last one we did, what year was that? 17, I want to say. 2017, I think that sounds right, but I don't know. It sort of is a blur. Uh, I know. Um, so, you know, maybe next year we're due for another one. Uh, absolutely. Well, you remember we had been starting to work on that before the pandemic. And, and I still think we need to do a tweak on the previous pay one or a, a small version of it, a one or two year plan. Um, and that's partly what I want to talk about next month when I give you guys the survey results so far. All right. We have a question from Becky. I was just going to ask if you can't count that survey that you just did to yeah, that. that <laughs> so, yeah, that's okay. one of the things, yeah. All right. So moving on, uh, chapter two, governance and administration. Oh, um, um, so... In the book, it has under point 13, it says um, the library has a chain of command in place that will provide a smooth transition process when key members of the library staff leave the organization. I would say, yes, absolutely, we have that. We have assistant department heads, assistant directors. Uh, that's all very, very clear. They put in the governance, in the uh, governance checklist though, they put library has a written succession plan focused on both internal and external talent development to fill anticipated needs for library leadership and other key personnel. And I am frankly not quite sure what that one means. So I feel like I need to understand that one better. There's been some discussion about it on the director's list and different libraries have very different things that they're calling succession plans. But, you know, I feel like the point that it matches, we do absolutely have, but I don't have like a written succession plan like that. And we talked about that briefly last year. So that is a thing to look at. The other one I wanted to look at, uh, library board reviews library policies on a regular basis. Um, I, I don't think we do that as regularly as we probably should. We should probably set up a schedule for looking at them in chunks and kind of trying to break it down into increments. So that's what I would Yeah, that would make sense. It, it is a time consuming process, yes. but I understand what you're saying. Yes, it is. Yep. And then on the personnel list, the personnel checklist, I didn't find anything that we aren't up to date on. We do need to be revising our, um, our uh, job descriptions and that is underway. So I actually think we're in fine shape for personnel. So those are the only three sections I wanted to cover this month. We'll cover a couple more next month that get more into building things. And I think there are a couple more things we'll need to discuss with that one. But we just need to, I just need to be sure that you guys all understand that we have this set of benchmarks we're supposed to be meeting and to just let you know where I think we might need a little bit more work on each category. And then I have to refer to that when I write the per capita grant next month. All right, okay. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Susan, what was the last point you mentioned that we need to work on? Just uh, was it on planning? Oh, okay. right, I guess I it's a little one. hard to grasp that entire sentence. What the, what kind of succession planning it's it's calling All right, for? I, got it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so Susan, one of the things it says is that the board of trustees, uh, uh, I can't remember where it is, attends a uh, seminars or conferences, right. uh, oh, participate in local, state, regional, and national 
Oh, no, I can't find it. I'm sorry. I, I remember that. You're right. It's on page yeah. 41 in the middle. Thank you. Yeah, um, national conferences, is pertinent to libraries when fiscally possible. Now, of course, we really haven't done anything this year. I'm trying to remember when we last went to any. It's been a well, long you long. and I went way south with Susan. Remember, yeah. we uh, went real far yes, south we went to Tilly Park. Actually, that wasn't too terribly long ago. Maybe that was, was that in January of last year? It's usually March. I got it. I almost I thought, thought it, was, it was two years ago. Yeah, it I was, thought it was. We were there in person. I do remember that. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, you're doing the legislative breakfast would be an example of that. There are, or, or uh, Becky going to the um, rails program with the budget planning and the succession planning or the onboarding part, which Carolyn, you watched also. So I th would, there, those would be examples of it. There are lots of webinars and things like that. Um, yeah. But. And you did meet with uh, Senator Ron Villavalum. That would qualify. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he, he was great. Yeah. You know, uh, great. I, I was just really so pleased to meet him. And he, he just, it felt like he really cared about us in our library. Yeah. Great guy. I agree. Um, yes, Patty? Yeah, the one I was thinking of is, yeah, we went to one that was out west, but we also went to one out south. But the one out west was, Again, the legislative breakfast. Yeah, because I've been to the, But then the one out south wasn't that in Tinley Park? Yeah, yeah. that was ILA. That but was the Illinois Library, Library Association. Yeah, because we went I went to ILA, was, but more than a year ago. But yeah, okay. You know, it was after I retired, so I know it yeah. was maybe a year and a half at most. Yeah. And I did ask um, ILA, I checked the website. They normally do have a program for trustees in March. And I asked and they said they aren't doing it in March, but they have uh, a set of um, sort of uh, uh, basic trustee training programs coming up in um, April and May. So. Oh, good. Are, okay. do, to your knowledge, are they going to be doing this all virtually or are they going to actually have where we can travel just I'm sure those will be virtual still. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, Susan, I trust that uh, you will follow up yep. on the points uh, you just mentioned that we need to address so we don't let that slip through the cracks. Uh, I don't, we don't really need to take any action with respect no. to that matter. Um, so we're down to other on the agenda. Is there any other that we need to add? Carolyn? I have an other um, I'd like to motion to go into executive session briefly. You can't do that. It's not on the agenda. But if I'm able to bring up an item under other. You, you, can't, you can't actually make session? any motions under other. You can't, you can't take any action that wasn't said on the agenda. It's, it's your opportunity to say, I think next month we should go into an executive session, but you also, with an executive session, you always have to say what it is for. Right, and what acceptable okay. reason it's um, for. I will, try to, I will try to bring this up in an open session. Um, is this an announcement or something? Lightly. No, it's, no, it's, um, well, let me start with how I, how can I do this? Um, all right. Um, under the Illinois Compiled Statutes for yeah. Library Districts, I, I wanted to, I wanted to um, just read a, um, one of the um, sections that pertain to us. And it says, a person is not eligible to serve as a library trustee unless he or she has resided in the library district at least one year at the time he or she files nomination papers or a declaration of intent to be a writing candidate or is presented for appointment. So I'm, I would like to ask as a board, are we all in compliance with this Illinois state statute? Um, why do you bring that and up, Carol? Who would be aware of that? I, you know, I don't is have any- Is that Susan as our election um, which not an election, well, election official. No, I don't have to check on that. It would be a good idea to, for people to ask that. Requirement again? 
you have to be a resident for one year, um, either from the, your um, date of candidacy or when you were presented for appointment in order to be eligible for a Niles being library trustee. I, I have not been. I moved, I moved here uh, and I did not know whether a crime. So. Okay. Um, if that's what you're well, asking. then that would mean we're in violation of this statute. How, how, um, how should we um, handle that? A I resident. I, that I, I did not, I did not know that requirement, nor was it presented to me. So um, I can discuss that uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, with appropriate persons. Well, in all fairness, it's um, it's a state statute, and um, I think it's something we need to abide by. Um, so um, I, I'm I'm a little surprised that you know it, I, I'm actually this is news, um, but um, I think we we need to abide by the statute, and we did happen to have many many applicants and us. Uh, we probably should consider going in that direction and make sure that we're all residents and have lived here within the time frame. It says one year. Yeah, I haven't been living here for, for one full year. All right, um, we'll, I think we'll have to uh, examine this during the uh, uh, next month. And uh, can we do it you... sooner? I mean, we're gonna wait a whole month knowing this is incorrect. Uh, I'm, but I mean, there's no particular action we can take right at the moment. Well, uh, we can have a special now that you've brought it up, Carolyn, it. we can examine this issue and determine what, if anything, we need to do. But I, I don't okay, know what, if anything, if we, we can do right this minute. Oh, no, no. So, I don't want to do anything this minute. How about if we schedule a special meeting to figure out what we're going to do? Um, That's what I'm well, asking. I don't want to wait yeah. a month. We need to know I'm, what we need to do. Well, I mean, we can address this at the next meeting because I don't we're think not we should wait an entire month knowing that we didn't handle anything this correctly. In the meantime, I mean, the board isn't taking any action in the meantime on anything in particular. So I don't need know that we need to take any action in uh, immediately. Really? Uh, no, okay, uh, you, I don't think we're planning on any meetings to take any action. So I think this Why? is something we can certainly look at and decide what we need to do um, after we've had a chance to examine the issue, which, well, which you've just brought to our attention right now. The, the issue is pretty simple. If wow. I'm not eligible to serve, then I will not continue to serve. That's, that's it. I mean, you know, if I'm not eligible, then, you know, we'll look into that. It's, it's, you I know, think, it's yeah, with all due respect, we owe Sorry. you that. Don't wait a um, month. Becky has her hand up. Yeah, I mean, Umer and I both are oh. the new ones here and weren't privy to the decisions that were made to bring us on board. Um, however, it was my understanding that you all voted for us. Um, and so that was a, a unit, a, you know, a, right. across the board. Um, so it's not just one person who is at fault here. And I feel bad for you, Umer, that you didn't know that. And that now this is the situation that you're in. However, yes, it needs to be remedied. Absolutely. Right. I'm thinking I, ahead I in the future now we have. Uh, Carolyn, if you remember when, when uh, I was up for the position, I made it very clear at that time that I had just recently moved to the library district. I made it very clear. And so if, None of us knew that that was a state requirement, and that is what it is. But, um, uh, you know, there was no deliberate action on anyone's oh, part, part, anyone else's part. This is not an accusation, it's an inquiry. Yeah. But I think we, we need to make sure in the future that um, the candidates that are given brought to us fit the requirements because right. now we're in a dilemma. Agreed. Agreed. But, um, I, I just don't think we should wait a month. I don't think it's fair to I, I, I agree. I agree with you on that. And I, as soon as as soon as this meeting closes, I will take take a look. If you want to go ahead and send that uh, over to Susan, then I can discuss it with her after that. Becky, uh, yeah, I'd like to finish. Um, I'm thinking ahead to whether or not if we need to have a special meeting for this or in the regular meeting, 
um, because we only have March, March and April meetings left of Omer and I being here on this board anyway. Um, and then the term will be up for right. election. So would we be better off having an extra meeting and then having to get someone in here for maybe possibly one month? Does that make I, sense? I, I, I don't think know. You actually have to look at the timing on that. There is a certain point where it, I, it, I don't think you would be up for election. I think this net, if you had to appoint another person, I think they would be on for two years and then be. Okay. But we, again, we would have to double check that. Got it. So that's why I'm saying that we will we'll look into all these issues after the meeting closes and we'll immediately take whatever actions need to be taken. So and, you know it's not um, wait a month, yes. but at the, at the yeah. same time, there's no point in having a meeting on it. If I'm not eligible to serve in this position because I haven't lived in the district for one full year, right. then I will immediately resign the position if, that's, if that is accurate. And does right. that really mean then we need to vacate that seat and get someone in it for two years instead of just having- I, no, I, no, I think I'm wrong. I think it's, there, there already is a ballot for that position. So right. I think they're just right. being, I think so, Umer would so just- again, like I said, I, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention and you know, we'll take whatever remedies need to be taken immediately. Yeah, okay, I think well, uh, we you. all have a little time to look at that. And um, so the next meeting would be the March meeting. And then uh, I think the election is actually April 6th. Yeah. So um, there really is only one meeting, the March meeting that would be left before the election takes place. So I, I really don't know if there's anything we can do in the meantime, uh, you know, assuming this is all correct, uh, pretty soon, very soon, uh, we're going to have new elected trustees in any event, um, which I believe would be seated at the April meeting, if I'm not mistaken, May. no? May. May, not till May, okay. But, uh, Re regardless, uh, just for the record, for the public record, um, in no vote did I participate that I was a tie-breaking vote. So even if my vote was never counted, it would have made no difference in any decision that was made by the library in all the time I've served here. And I know that for a fact. Yeah, I, I believe that is correct. It's um, a good point, Amir. Thank you. So, um, you know, I think we need to take a little time to look at this and uh, try and uh, figure out what uh, needs to be done now. But at this point, I, I don't see that we can really accomplish anything or that there's really any need for a special meeting. I'm not sure what, if anything, we would do anyway uh, at this point in time. I really don't see that it would make sense for us to fill a seat for one or two meetings. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not uh, at this point in time, it, it just it just doesn't make sense to do that. So I think uh, we'll go ahead with our schedule for the next meeting in March as we would uh, normally do that. Um, can oh. I um, just share this? Um, uh the um, IELTS, the 75 ILCS section. Sh should I give it to Susan since you might want to talk about this later? Um, you can give the site if you'd like to, uh, Carolyn, if that's what you want to read to no, us. No, it's the Illinois State Statute. I, I don't know. Do you know where it is if you don't need it from what's me? And the, you, you what's don't. the section? ILCS? Yeah, what yes. if, if you want to read it's off seven, the site, go ahead. It's 75 ILCS 16. And the section is 30-20. Okay. All right. Thank and, you very and much. And just an, and another note, mm -hmm. um, maybe we wouldn't need to fill that position for two months. Right. Well, that's I what mean, I would say. Yeah. Well, you'd have to look into. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's legal. I, I haven't, I don't know. Okay. Well, I just needed to um, clear the air and bring that up. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Sorry about All right. that, but it was brought to my attention and I thought I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. I'll okay, I'll Carolyn, thank that. you for bringing it to our attention. All right. Is there any other uh, announcement um, or matter that we need to discuss this evening? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I have such a motion? Uh, motion. Patty? 
I see you ha your hand and then Linda. So we have a first and a second. Uh, Cindy, would you please call the roll? Patty and Linda. Okay. Um, Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Becky? Becky? Yes. Thank you. Diane? Diane? Yes. Lumiere? Well, since I don't know if yes. I vote or not, I'm just going to abstain. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. Okay. I do note that our next meeting is on St. Patrick's Day. Yes. I hope we will not be going extremely late. I just throw that out there as an important consideration. <laughs> what it's worth. To the person who makes the agenda. <laughs> so, um, Are you afraid you'll miss out on your corned beef and cabbage? <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation this evening. And uh, uh, Umir, we'll, we will talk, uh, I, I presume, in the next few days or weeks. And uh, at this point, I, I think we just need to conclude the meeting and uh, look into this matter a little further. Sounds all good. right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Right. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye.